Can you hear me now? Very good. Uh, so is everyone in the, the room now? Uh, can you please uh, send yes or press the hand button on there? Good. So uh, now we've got about 13 participants. Uh, so sorry for the delay. Uh, I just want to say thank you for coming. Um, and this is our first day for the Focus Pool Initiative online, where I will be talking about focus pooling and camera assisting in general. Uh, so <clears throat> Let's start with the uh, very basic. So uh, I want to talk about the history, a brief history, not the full version, because if it's the full version, it's going to be longer than the whole duration of this workshop for this one day. Uh, so basically, uh, Camera assistants are people who essentially runs the camera department and well, basically we just uh, manages the camera equipment and everything. Um, and then uh, among other things, we have camera operators and, and directors of photography. Uh, they, are, they are too, although they are more on the creative side, but they are also uh, a, a part of camera department. And I just want to ask a question. Uh, how many of you here are actually camera assistants? Okay, I see one, two, three. So just three people, four, okay? Any more? That's it? Okay. So, uh, I promise that I will try my best to speak in both language, languages, Malay and English. Uh, how many of you here are, uh, how many of you here prefer in Malay? Okay, one, two, any more? Okay, so uh, camera department, uh, kita ada camera operator, director of photography, first assistant camera dengan second assistant camera atau uh, itu semua American punya terms. Uh, kalau kita go over to England punya terms pula, we call camera assistant pula um, for, well, DPs are either lighting cameraman or cinematographers. Um, and then first assistant cameras are either, well, that's just, there really is just one name other than first AC. It's a uh, focus player, which I am. And uh, the second assistant uh, is a bit different. Uh, they are called clapper loaders. Um, why? Okay. Clapper loaders are essentially, they are, the ones that loads the film. Back in the film days, they call them clapper loaders because they, after they load the film, they also have to take the slate or clapper board and you know, sync sound and visual. So uh, other than that, they also have to carry camera equipment and they have to work with the first assistants. Um, and then uh, they also have to, um, 
communicate with production. Um, and other than that, uh, the first is, let's go for the first is, because, okay, basically the whole workshop, I'm just going to be talking about first assistance and second assistance. Why? Because, uh, well, that's all that I think I should be covering about. Because uh, let me tell you about, let me talk about the Focus Puller Initiative online. This workshop is supposed, was supposed to be uh, very interactive, very um, technical and very practical workshop where you can be here and you know uh, practice with the equipment, uh, interact with me live uh, without the uh, obstruction of cameras, you know. And then uh, basically workshop me uh, untuk train semua orang yang either dah pernah buat camera assistant atau belum pernah buat camera assistant untuk jadi camera assistant. Uh, at the end of the workshop, I will be introducing the camera technician's guild. Uh, camera technician's guild is basically a guild or association that house all the camera operators, focus pullers and second assistant. Anyone in the camera department will be under camera technicians guild. What we do is basically we want to uh, educate and help regulate everyone that works in the camera department um, to make sure that we have the utmost, I guess, quality in our work because we want to, you know, uh, make sure that we have the uh, standards that can reflect to Road to Oscars. So, um, first assistant cameras. Focus pullers back then, uh, pada mulanya, um, focus pullers ni, this is, a, this is actually a history that uh, I learned through one of my reading through articles, which I found online, and some of them are from books. Uh, they briefly talk about camera assistants as people who just carry camera equipment. Because back then, camera operators were um, essentially, they pull the focus, okay? So they don't really need focus pullers until the day comes yang Jorang finally shoot um, motion pictures for cinema. So bila dah shoot for cinema, when people are moving, you cannot expect, you know, pull focus and reframe as you go, you know? So you need focus pullers. So that's how the first focus puller, well, invented, okay? So um, from there, from, because there were, uh, as they moved on, equipments jadi bertambah, bertambah, bertambah. Back then, kalau nak ikutkan, uh, cinematographers di zaman uh, 1930s, 1920s, those days, um, cinematographers, they have to come up with their own version of the camera so that they can, you know, deliver a certain kind of uh, aesthetics to a certain kind of movie, okay? So because of that, um, the orang juga apa, uh, basically pioneer in the camera technology itself until, you know, Ari Munich and stuff like that. Because if you go to America, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, companies that make cameras, you know? Uh, if you've heard of Wisecam or something like that, uh, there are quite a lot of cameras out there. I'm not gonna go uh, too much into too much details of the camera companies that there are in the US, but yes, there are quite a few. Uh, so from there, uh, from the focus puller, because of the because of the equipment semua dah bertambah, they tambah lagi satu crew. They call them back then. If I'm not mistaken, they call them camera boys or something like that. Until uh, they have to they they added more work to them, which they have to load films because back then the fo the focus puller have have to load the films themselves. So afterwards, bila dah focus puller nak kena pull focus nak kena measure uh and then not gonna you know load films jadi too much work 
So they pass that work on to the second assistant, which they only call them second assistants afterwards, lah. Because but by then they orang dah, dah ada, you know, uh, by then they orang dah ada kena buat camera report, kena load films, kena, um, you know, a lot of other stuffs. And then, um, well, of course, there's camera trainees, but camera trainees semua muncul later on. Muncul later on bila uh, the camera technicians dah have become more established. Uh, they essentially, what's that? No, it was, it's not green screen, bro. This is actual stuff. See? This is a lens. This is a WCU. Battery. Hmm? It's all real. It's not green screen, bro. Okay. Back to my story. Back to my very long story. So, uh, camera assistants essentially are people young, um, like the DITs, if you've ever heard of DITs. DITs came about after the advent of uh, digital cinematography. Uh, after, I think quite recently, lah. I think the, the last 12 years, baru ada wujudnya DIT. Uh, so camera assistants until now, in fact, uh, kita keep growing though, because different countries have different um, names that they call the camera assistant. Like, uh, second assistant in the US is called clap loader in the UK, but somewhere else in the world, maybe they call them something else. Maybe they, call, they just call them camera technicians. In fact, I've heard uh, in the US, the first assistant is also called the first assistant technician, not camera assistant. See? So basically, the terms too, they keep changing, they keep growing, but they all do the same thing. In, uh, essentially, camera assistants, they are punya kerja adalah untuk assist. Okay, it's just, it's just in the word. So, what makes a camera assistant? What makes them, you know, unique or stand apart from other departments? So, camera assistants essentially um, have to deal with expensive equipment, have to deal with uh, people, uh, really nasty people. In fact, I've, you know, multiple times have to deal with people from uh, the AD department or director's department, even production managers who are awful to people, you know. And it's not, it's not that I, you know, choose to deal with them. It's part of the job. Part of your job is basically to liaise with a lot of people. In fact, there are times uh, when I have to talk to the talents personally or actors personally, I have to talk to them, which is actually not a good thing to practice because if you must know, camera assistants are not allowed. I mean, it's not, it's not really a rule, but it's like a, it's like a, you know, understanding between, um, well, I mean, it's more or less like common sense. You don't want to bother the actors while they're, you know, uh, practicing their lines or trying to get in the mood, you know. You don't want to go to them, okay, this is your mark, okay, while they're practicing their dialogues. That's one quickest way for you to get kicked out from the production, really. Okay, uh, I think, uh, what's that? There are two attendees that are waiting to be get into the Zoom call. Who are they? Are they, are, are, are these two attendees? Nilesh and? Uh, who's that? Okay. There anyway, uh, maybe kita boleh try. Ah, uh, yeah. Invite and then check to see. Yeah. 
Let me check my WhatsApp. Hold on. Sorry for the delay, guys. I'm just trying to get these guys in so that we can continue. Uh, but I can multitask, you know. Uh, I am a camera assistant after all. Um, yeah, so uh, essentially what we now are practicing uh, in the camera department is basically you have to be invincible in a way. Uh, in a way, you kind of have to be honest as well because, you know, when you're dealing with the expensive equipments, you, you, you know, you have to be honest. You have to be truthful and, you know, you have to own up to your mistakes, right? Okay. So, uh, Camera assistance. Uh, second assistance. No, I'm not finished with first assistant yet. In fact, I haven't started with the first assistant. So, um, focus pullers. Focus pullers, they are punya tugas basically adalah untuk mengekalkan sharpness gambar. Um, and then, obviously, their jobs is to, you know, pull focus. Um, and then they are also the ones managing the camera equipment. They are also the ones that um, move the camera, uh, you know, whenever the shot is uh, changing elsewhere, you have to move the camera there. But you also have to remember, uh, there, are, there are times when you are working with a bigger production where you have a camera grip, that's when you have to draw the line between uh, the camera and the camera support. Uh, so that's the only thing that you have to, you know, always keep in mind that you, although you prep the whole equipment, but there are some stuff that you must understand you cannot touch when you're dealing with the bigger production with the bigger camera crew, because although you are the first and second assistant, you also have the either camera trainee or in Malaysia, we have uh, third assistant cameras. Uh, I don't believe that they have that kind of title anywhere else in the world, but they do have camera trainees or camera interns or I don't know, whatever they call them, but it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. Uh, so, um, so Ashraf Nazmi, are you in yet? Ashraf Nazmi and Nilesh. Ashraf Nazmi. Okay, you're in. Okay. How about Nilesh? Are you in? Okay, good. So, uh, sorry you've missed, a, uh, you've missed a good, what, 22 minutes, 20 minutes? Okay, but you're still not far yet. So, basically, camera assistants or focus pullers are people who... Uh, okay, let's talk about focus pullers. Focus pullers, they are the people who deal with... Um, when you know before you start a project you have to deal with the production managers you have to deal with the rates you have to deal with the um, you have to deal with the camera crews you have to you know scout camera crews scout camera equipments um, and then you have to be the one that you know communicates between the production and the camera crew you have to be the essentially the there is this one um, focus puller in the US that once said in an interview uh, that focus pullers are basically like producers 
but they, you know, they're not above the line, they're actually below the line, but they act as producers. Why? Because essentially they have to, you know, if the DP wants something, you have to get that for them. You have to find the equipment, you have to, if you need more crews, you, have, you are the one handling that, you are the one dealing with the production, you know, because uh, after all, when you're pulling focus, it's your name on it, you know? Um, and if you want to scout other focus pullers to pull focus, you have to find focus pullers that are, um, um, focus pullers that are, what's that? Is that a question? Uh, someone just asked, what does it mean by focus? Oh, okay. So um, what does, uh, that, that, there was a question actually. Uh, so focus pullers and focus pool. What's the difference between the two things? Okay, focus pool is basically the action of pulling focus. Uh, and focus pullers are essentially the one, the person that is pulling that focus. Um, if I hope that answers the question. Okay, so uh, back to my story. Focus pullers are the ones that communicates with the production. They are the ones that handles everything camera department. Okay. Um, and, you know, when there's uh, special setups or, you know, uh, camera builds, you are the one overseeing that. Even though there's technicians, you are the one doing that after all. Um, the second assistants, however, uh, or clapper loaders, um, they are basically the ones that works with the focus pillars, you know, uh, because uh, second assistants, they exist to essentially, back then during the film days, uh, they are the ones loading the uh, film and uh, loading the film and then uh, writes camera reports, um, handles the slates and uh, and many other things actually. They, they, they charge the batteries, they uh, sometimes get some coffee for me or you know for other people or the DP. And uh, well basically that's about it. <laughs> I mean, the history about them is uh, pretty simple, actually. So, uh, any questions so far about what I'm, you know, about what I've talked about? Any questions? You can post those questions in the Q and A Q and A um, tab down there. Any questions? You know, it helps. It helps for me to tell stories when uh, you've got questions. For now, I'm just gonna tell talk about the history. But you know, after this, I'll be talking about how to prep a project, how to slate, how to prep cameras. In fact, I won't be talking about it. I'll be demonstrating. But for now, I would like some questions. Okay, Farid, hit me. Okay. And the question is? Okay. Basically, uh, there is this, well, it's very simple. The first assistant has to be the one responsible with the camera equipment. Um, if anything happens, you have to understand how it happened. You know, if let's say I have this one 
um, incident where the camera drops on the floor. Well, it didn't actually drop. It, you know, fell down. But it was on the tripod. It was on the tripod. And the tripod was on a boat. And the water was, you know, quite choppy. It was quite wavy during the day. Uh, what had happened is that uh, there was a, the, the tripod wasn't, you know, rigged well enough for it to, you know, stand properly. And at that time, you have to understand, I did my job to keep the camera, um, you know, like lens, like if you can see, if you can see in this camera here, uh, that's this camera here, you know, basically we've got camera grips at the time and we've got the camera, right? Camera assistant, I mean, sorry, the camera grip and we have the camera assistant, which is, which was me. Um, basically, if we have camera grips, my responsibility at the time is from here on up. See, uh, you can see there's the, there's this one plate here. This is, uh, this is the Euro quick release plate. My, my concern, once I have a camera grip on set, my concern starts from this point up. See? That's my only responsibility. Because we have a camera grip, okay? Because, yeah, see here? Okay, this is the tripod. This is what we call the camera support. Camera support is normally, um, people who handles camera support is essentially the camera grips. Okay, because I've had, I've done this one shoot where I'm not even allowed to touch the, not say loud, but you know, I'm not even, you know, worried about the head because someone else is going to handle that. My only concern starts from here on out. Okay, so if something, if an accident, like I just said, happens, my, you have to, you have to understand when the camera falls, uh, what happens after that? Is did the lens uh, did the lens fall off from the camera, or uh, is the monitor you know uh, smashed into something, or something else on the camera itself breaks down, or you know uh, scratch, or you know the lens maybe you know broken or something. If something like that happens, that's my responsibility. But because we have a fluid head here, and because it falls down on the floor. Perfectly. I mean, it's all attached. There's no, the camera didn't even, you know, come off from the, the, the head. So essentially you have to take into account what was not done on the day. So the only thing that wasn't done is the camera was not properly rigged. So I, I don't want to put blames on anyone because uh, during the day, there was a series of uh, things happening and we couldn't avoid some of the things. So it was a split second kind of a accident because we didn't, you know, and I wasn't there. In fact, someone else was uh, looking after the camera. I don't want to say who. In fact, please don't tell anyone outside of this workshop the story, okay? This is just between you guys and me, okay? What's that? I, I see a question there. Do you do second AC usually included in the prep? Yes. Yes. In fact, second ACs are the ones uh, helping me with the uh, consumables or expendables. Uh, they help me draft the list. They even help me, you know, uh, manage some tools. Uh, they even help me with the camera builds. Uh, setups, you know, sometimes with the, um, well, they do camera reports, obviously. So basically second assistant have to be there during prep. In fact, they have to be there even before prep because they have to know uh, the type of shoot they are going into. Uh, in fact, uh, first assistant before they hire someone, before they point, someone to be the second assistant, they have to essentially assess the project itself. Because before the shoot, like for me, I would like to um, get the script so that I could read the script and then figure out what kind of shoot it is. If I see something like say a rainy situation, I know, uh, 
I know someone who, you know, has the, the most amount of, you know, rain covers or the most amount of umbrellas or something like that. I would definitely call that guy or that lady, that girl, you know, because obviously I have to scout for camera assistant. I have to choose my camera assistant. I can't just, you know, hire someone who doesn't know the job or doesn't know how to do the job, you know, doesn't have experience. I can't just hire someone who's fresh off the boat and then, um, you know, does something like uh, set up like a gimbal back there. If you can see the gimbal, I don't think you can see the gimbal, but th there is a gimbal back there. Uh, I kind of have to hire someone who knows what they're doing or at least, you know, willing to learn what, you know, what I'm going to, you know, push them to learn, you know? So yes, the short answer is second assistants are not only um, needed during prep, they are also needed before that because I have to discuss with them what I need and what they have to do, and what the project is about, what the project is like, because, you know, it is what it is. Because in Malaysia, you don't really have um, that much amount of prep because if you're doing a support job, like a, a job from... Uh, anywhere in the world, you most likely have two weeks, one week to two weeks of prep, okay? You can prep quite a lot of things. You can prep, uh, if you can see this bag here, this bag is my ditty bag or floor bag or set bag or whatever you want to call them. Uh, this bag is what I use to, um, to keep all my tools, like this one, like this uh, Allen keys and uh, slate, mini slate, it's in a bag. Because, you know, this thing is expensive. You know, I don't want to break it. It should be in a bag. You have to also protect your equipment, not just the equipment that you take from the rental houses, but you also have to protect your own equipment because you invested in it. So you have to take care of them. Okay. I see a question there. Pro gaff sucks in our humid weather here what do you do to improve the stickiness or do you use other brands of tape i keep mine in the dry box yes i keep prograph in the dry box lol okay uh well i i don't really i don't really worry that much about prographs or any tape because usually if i'm gonna use tape and if I need it to be sticky, I would just buy new ones, you know, because why do you want to use um, recycled tape on something, on some rigs that, uh, that requires that stickiness, right? I mean, obviously, you want your camera equipment to be safe. So why risk it? Don't risk your camera equipment just because of cost. I mean... At the end of the day, you kind of have to take care of your own equipment, right? Um, I see another question there. Another one. Andai kata situasi berlaku melibatkan letupan ataupun pelanggaran di dalam se sebuah babak keselamatan kamera jatuh pada kamera assistant atau grip department, especially yang melibatkan jarak yang berdekatan. Especially yang melibatkan jarak yang berdekatan. Okay, there are two things that um, you have to understand. Camera, obviously, kita, if we are doing explosive punya scenes, scenes yang require camera to berdekatan dengan explosion, kita kena make sure that camera uh, berada di dalam um, Satu container atau we call them crash box or you know something else you know any form of protection is protection regardless of uh, its you know strength or you know if it actually protects the camera but you have to understand uh, normally on bigger projects like um, like I've been in projects like uh, Strike Back or Tian Ho. Uh, those kind of projects, they have uh, uh, safety officers that would advise you on the camera safety. They would tell you, okay, camera ni, 
dia cakap dalam English lah tapi dalam uh, translation dia kamera ni kau nak letak dalam apa kamera ni takkan kau nak biar dekat atas meja dengan api semua datang cahaya kamera tu ni mic box ni senang apa ni cahaya kan so dia akan tanya benda-benda tu sebelum benda tu berlaku dia akan bagi tahu okey explosion ni uh, this many kind of fire this big of a fire this fire is coming this way that fire is coming this way and there's bombs here there's bombs there okay so what are you going to do if you have a crash box put it inside the crash box lah kan janganlah uh, kamera tu letak kat luar so dah masuk dalam crash box what happens if that crash box let's say melt or i don't know there are some there is actually in tianhu there was this uh, there were a couple of uh, a7s yang duduk dalam crash box tapi cair why because the crash box is made out of steel crash box tu dah kena jilat dengan api yang sangat besar in fact that explosion was a freak explosion and it's so close to um, the, the the video village the cameras itself it was so close we can feel the heat as though we are in there imagine that okay camera tu semua cair apa benda ni semua it's because of that steel okay because that box is made out of steel it heats up obviously so it goes to show that although let's say lah that crash box is from the grip department okay it goes to show that although you are in grip department you should know a thing or two about physics okay which is why you have to understand you can't use you know normal steel to handle fire to handle heat there has to be you know even camera pun ada this one apa ni a fire blanket fire blankets too they use that to essentially just you know put a simple cover in case of you know sparks of fire ke small fires come into close contact to the camera uh, kita nak avoid benda-benda tu jadi kita letak blanket kan but again kalau benda macam tu jadi the only uh, quick answer that you can give to let's say the production lah you already put it in the crash box but it melt it melted or it breaks down or the camera is not functioning anymore. in fact there was this one time during strike back um, the camera it wasn't in a crash box it was actually in a or was it in a crash box i think i think it was in a crash box the camera uh, heated up so it, it became so hot the sensor burnt up and it came up with just white pictures it's only pixels it's, there's no picture at all and uh, at that time you can't blame the camera system you can't blame the grips there wasn't any explosion there wasn't anything the camera was just sitting there so that's the the thing about and then we now we have to go into insurance that's why we have to have insurance and it's you know when we have insurance if something like that happens you don't just you know blame it on the camera system i mean you know you have insurance all you need is a camera report not a camera report i mean a loss and damage report to you know report what happened you know that kind of thing you know you kind of have to speak with the production managers or um, you know people of you know higher power you know so basically that's not if something like that happens it's nobody's fault in fact well it's not really fault the only person that has to answer is the dp or the camera operator sorry not camera operator, or the grips because camera is there the safety is there so these are the two people that have to answer to the uh, problems you know do you think i've answered your question yeah good times blame sony well i don't want to blame sony you know any other questions Oh, was it you that asked the pro graph? Uh, David, come on. You know as well as I do. Why would you want to use reuse tapes? Yeah. 
Yes, UK, US productions. Because um, does it really apply to Malaysian productions too? Okay. Uh, with Malaysian productions, the problem becomes when when you don't have insurance. This is the thing that you have to. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to talk about this uh, on the next segment, which is how to prep the project, because maybe I could go into that now. I mean, the history is pretty much nothing. I mean, okay, let's just go into how to prep a project. Okay, so basically, before you start pre prepping for a project, uh, the first thing that will happen is you will get a call from the DP or producer or you know anyone from production to find out about your availability and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, that, you, that normally happens to me anyways. So what happens then is that you need to figure out the uh, job scope that you're doing. Although you already know you're going to be, let's say you're a persistent, you're a focus puller. You already know that your job is to pull focus, but you kind of have to understand are you there just to pull focus or are you there to help them with, because you have to understand you are also a camera technician. You have to advise them on what camera, what the camera can or cannot do. Because if you, here's a, here's a little thing about safety. Um, when you're in the camera department and you're talking about safety, you can't just, you know, point it, point your finger to the safety officer because you have to understand safety officers make safe uh, safety assessments for you to read for you the first assistant to read this is i'm talking about uh, uk or us productions lab for you to read and for you to you know uh, essentially use that as a guideline to supervise your camera crew okay because you have your camera crew you have to supervise them you have to tell them if it's safe or not safe Okay, and not only that, you also have to uh, basically nasihat production into, let's say, okay, I'm doing this shot. I'm doing a shot. This camera is going to be on a car. It's going to be offset from a car. It's going to be like this. It's going to be very dangerous. It's going to be low, very low, almost low to the ground, let's say. Um, and you worry about safety. You, as the first assistant, have to understand the safety hazards you know i mean i mean it's a common sense really i mean the camera is that low i mean rock can you know can fly up you know i don't know from where but apparently it does happen in fact it's happened to someone i know some it happened to someone before it hasn't happened to me but yeah it's a safety issue that you kind of have to oversee i mean it's the reason why we even have these these are okay let me just tell you, these are called optical flats. Essentially, it's a glass. It's not a filter. It's just a clear glass. It says on the side here, Tiffin Clear USA. I mean, if I've got a top shot here, I think you guys can see. It. I don't know if you can see the Tiffin. Yeah, yeah. you're not going to see it. It's too small and it's uh, opaque. It's not really... I mean, the, the, what it says, there's, there's actually an inscription on the side here. It says Tiffin Clear USA. Uh, I think uh, Lin Vin LV knows what I'm talking about. Uh, there's actually something written here on the side, Tiffin Clear USA. So basically this thing, what it does is essentially it becomes the first protection before some anything hits the lens. If say, the car is going this way, the camera is this way, you know, facing forwards, right? The car is going that way, and camera is facing that way. You bound, you are bound to have stuff flying to the lens, you know. So what do you have to do? You have to protect the lens, obviously. You take this thing, you put them in the map box, uh, preferably, you know closest the closest tray to the lens to protect the lens so why do you do that if it's not because of your you know safety assessment you know that safety hazards so you 
are the first line of defense before something happens, you know? Uh, like say the, the story I just told you just now. In fact, I um, the only reason why that camera fell down is because of one man who who fails to listen to my advice, left the camera unattended, fell down. See, as a first assistant, it's my job to you know advise people when you're doing something that you're not supposed to. You know, it's a uh, like say, okay, going back to the story about the camera on the car thing. So obviously you're gonna deal with traffic, minimal, heavy traffic, whichever. That's, tra that's bound to be some cars on the highway, right? So you have to take into account uh, whether you need um, a follow van or follow vehicle, whatever, following from behind or from the preceding the car the hero car, whatever, to protect the camera. Because sometimes people would do that to protect the camera, you know? Or uh, there are occasions where we have to put some um, cloth next to the camera just to, uh, as, a, as a way of signaling other drivers or other cars to, you know, keep away from the camera. So basically, kita akan letak apa, safety measures. We try our best, stuff can happen. It, you know, there are, uh, back then there was a, uh, a job, uh, Care Gangster, I think. It was either Care Gangster or uh, Care Drift or something like that. Uh, job too, okay, th this is actually a, a quite a fun story. Um, interesting, not fun, it's not fun. Interesting story because there was this one shot there was this one rig, the camera is on the car. Uh, apa yang jadi, basically, camera tu, I think, hit something. The, and then the camera topple or something. And then uh, the rig stayed put, but the lens came off. So whose fault is that? Hmm. Do you know, uh, do you, who, who would you blame? Okay, the camera is rigged properly. Tapi accident, and then the lens fell off, but the camera stayed put on the rig. Who are you going to blame? Can you give me any answers? Right. Okay, that's one answer. Anyone else wanna, you know, fill in? Okay, the person who attached the lens. AC. Okay. So, yeah. Normally, uh, the person who would handle the lens are the camera assistant. So, sadly, after that accident happened, the camera assistant, I don't know, they probably, you know, potong dia punya gaji to pay back the lens or something. I don't know. But, you know, a deal uh, was, you know, they probably came to a an agreement or something like maybe orang tu kena kerja dengan because at the time they took the equipment from Cinerat so I think maybe that guy I don't know spent two three years kerja free dekat Cinerat I don't know but you know you have to deal with your mistakes you know okay so I I, I think I saw another question there does it really apply to Malaysian productions too actually um it's a yes and no question because uh, that's the weird thing about um, Malaysian production, you know? When you want safety, production will blame you. But when you are talking about, let's say, uh, I want my payment. Let's say you promised me my payment to be at the end of, you know, so-and-so dates, right? 
but production, you know, tends to, you know, delay it or that's regarding payments. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a gray area in terms of, you know, because I can't really, um, well, I can, you know, give my two cents on Malaysian production. I mean, of course, there are some things that we can't do uh, that we can't do in Malaysian production that we can do in foreign production. Like uh, we don't have safety officers on Malaysian productions, which is uh, uh, quite a sad thing because um, here's the thing about safety officers. Safety officers, they, uh, their jobs is basically to evaluate uh, your project. Like say you want to go shoot in a quarry, uh, and you need to know the safety hazards that there that would be, you know. Um, and of course, you you as a camera assistant, you you know you're not really well versed in in uh, you know occupational hazards. I mean, you're not trained to uh, evaluate danger, you know. But you try your best to you know use your common sense. I mean, if you if you think about it, I mean, even the subject of on the subject of physics is basically the study of you know uh, the world around us. I mean, it's pretty much a common sense. I mean, let's say you know about gravity, and you put something like this. You you put one thing standing like this, and you're hoping for it to you know stand up. No, it's you know it's gravity, man. You can't expect for something like this to stand like this, you know. It's essentially common sense. I mean, that's just you know safety stuff. But again, uh, it's a yes and no thing uh, when you're talking about safety. Uh, sorry, uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, what I've described before. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, you kind of have to work around the limitations. Like say, you know that this production is not taking any insurance, right? So the only safety measures that you can take is by saying no. I mean, don't worry about not getting your next job with the company. If you know it's dangerous, you just let them know. Okay, if something happens, you have to answer for it. I'm not going to answer for it because I already told you it's dangerous. Okay, because normally that's what I do. In fact, last year I, I, I did a job um, with a... A Chinese production, it's called Envision or something. I can't even remember. Uh, this production, uh, there was this one night, um, there was this shot. This camera is, you know, at the very edge of the, uh, of the curb. And this is the, the main road where, well, let me give you the context. There's a truck hitting a car, okay? So this truck was supposed to hit the car and the car is supposed to, you know, um, drift along with the, uh, the truck at, at a certain distance, you know, uh, I think, I think they were suggesting that it was going to be about um, 20 to 60 feet of drift. Okay. So uh, when we placed the camera, the camera was within that range of um, danger because they were telling us that the danger zone is between 20 to 60 feet. So we place the camera, you know, just within that uh, boundary, the, the 20 to 60 feet uh, boundary of danger. And uh, the camera at the time uh, was low on the ground. It was, uh, I think it was on a high hat. Um, and then there was this one, um, there was this, uh, there, were, there were a few of the grip boys, they were talking about what if the truck came running past by the camera. They didn't suggest that the car is, I mean, the truck is hitting the camera. They are suggesting that the truck is driving, driving past the camera. So it hit me. What if the truck hits the camera, right? So I decided to go over to the uh, production office, which is, uh, it's a mobile production office, not really, you know, production office, basically just, Two long tables and you know a bunch of people sitting around just looking at you you know so 
I went over to the production office, the mobile production office, to talk to the production manager. I said to them, uh, I think you need to come over to the set. And then she said, um, why? I've got lots to do. I think you're going to want to come to the set. And she comes to the set and I showed her the, the camera setup. I told her, okay, here's what the, the stunt guys are telling me. The stunt guys are telling me that this truck is going to hit this car and the danger zone is between 20 to 60 feet. Okay? So imagine that. Imagine that the, 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 the truck drive past the camera, but instead of going past the camera, hits the car, uh, hits the camera. Who's going to answer for that? And then she says, uh, ask the DP la. The DP is responsible what? No, the DP can just, you know, raise his hand and, you know, bugger off. He will not, you know, he's going to say that uh, because my camera is, my camera, uh, because I was doing B camera. A camera was the DP's camera. B camera is the OP's camera. So, Operator is obviously not going to operate the camera because the camera is a lock-off camera. Whatever I did to the camera, it's my responsibility. So I have to answer for the camera if in case there's something happened to the camera. So basically, uh, I was the person uh, in charge of that, right? So I told the production manager, uh, can we do something about this? Can we move the camera or... I don't know, can you tell the stunt guys to make the danger zone uh, a bit less than 60 feet? Because the camera, to, because the way they measured the 20 to 60 feet range is from wherever the, because the car is stationary, right? The truck is coming from a distance hitting the car. How they measure it is basically from that car, from that car's stationary position uh, to 60 feet over. That's how they measure it measured the uh, danger zone, right? So I told the production manager, can we move the camera or, you know, tell them to make it less than 60 feet? And then uh, the production manager went over to the stunt guys. They said, you know what they said after that? We don't know where it's going to go. It could be 60 feet. It could be 80, you know, even they're not sure what's going to happen. So what I did is that I angkat tangan lah. I said, okay. I already told you the danger. I told you what's going to happen. I don't want to, you know, work free for this production because uh, we work really long hours. I mean, 40, 14 hours a day. I mean, they pay the OTs, but the OTs is not the, you know, the actual rates. So there's a bit of problem there. So I don't want to lose money just because, um, you know, I fail to take care of my equipment. So what happened was they decided to move the camera. So we did. And uh, um, well, basically that's that. And then and the truck actually drove past the camera. Imagine that. But we did move the camera. Uh, we used a longer lens. But yeah, it didn't, it didn't reach the camera second position, the, the, the newly revised position. But it did pass the first position that we were planning uh, in the beginning. So basically, we kind of you know dodged that bullet. Um, yeah, that's you know you as a first assistant. That's what that's your base. That's basically your first job to do on set. You have to be that person to take care of the safety of equipment of camera crew. Um, yeah, basically the lives of your of your second assistants, your camera trainee, if you have a B camera, the life of the first assistant for the B camera and the second assistant for B camera, they are, they are all depending on you to take care of them. So when you're the first AC for A camera, you have to be responsible. So that's the safety part. And uh, does anybody else have any question about uh, what I've talked so far? Can we uh, scroll up? Scroll up. Oh, oh uh, 
Let's discuss that. Yes. Uh, more? Because attack? Uh, siapa salah? Siapa bayar? Siapa salah? Siapa bayar? Okay. Or are we more strict, less lenient? Actually, we are more dumb. We're not strict or less lenient. We just, you know, dumb enough to not, you know, attack them head on, you know, on issues of safety or insurance. Because, um, but for me, back then, I, I did the, uh, back then, I, I used to do that same mistake, you know, where I don't ask the production if they, they are, you know, paying for insurance or stuff like that, you know. Uh, I, I used to assume that they, took insurance for the equipment, which uh, lucky enough they did, but you know, not enough because some, some production companies, they take a certain amount of insurance, which covers, uh, let's say your damage is, I don't know, 100,000, but they only cover 60,000 or 30,000, which doesn't cover a lot. It doesn't cover much. In fact, there was uh, this one accident um, a few years back where the camera, uh, dips into this lake. Um, luckily, they they fixed it. Uh, it wasn't the camera assistant's fault. It wasn't the grip's fault. It was actually well. It's just you know silly silly people doing silly things. You know, uh, not minding um, safety because they were on water, and the boat was um, I think twelve people heavy. And then uh, they were all gathering in the nose of the boat, which actually became the reason why the boat even toppled. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I used to do the mistake where I don't um, talk about the insurance with the production. I don't you know, really care about it. I don't know why, because it's actually quite an important thing to talk about with production. Because I used to have, uh, I used to fall from a, there was this one time that I fell down from a ladder. But, well, basically I hurt myself and then, uh, well, I didn't get any insurance claim. I mean, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the uh, sad guy talking about his life, but you know, it's the facts. And I didn't even ask them about insurance then. So, and because of that, I, I changed the way I, I do things. I start asking about safety, about, you know, uh, insurance. You know, it takes one incident for you to learn from, you know, uh, which goes to show that mistakes are there for you to learn from. So it's okay to make mistakes, but it's not okay for you to repeat that. I mean, obviously, you don't want to, you know, you want to get more jobs. So I, I think uh, there's a question from uh, David just now. I saw a new feed. What if BCAM was in this situation and the screw up will, and they screw up? Will they look at you for mismanagement in this situation? Uh, yeah, scroll atas, atas. Person who attached it. Okay, scroll back down. What well, if B cam was in this situation and they screw up? Will they look at you for mismanagement? Um, well, I will definitely have to answer for it because I'm the first AC, right? Um, because I have to tell them, okay, this is the safety issue. You have to do this, that, you know. But um, uh, more often than not, uh, they are. Uh, B camera, I would just, you know, let them do their thing because I normally would give, because it's, you have to understand, you're working so far a distance apart from each other, you know? Uh, like say, I'm working, I'm do, I'm, my camera is here. B camera is like, um, I don't know, 500 meter, meters away from me. So I would tell them, just, you know, just go over there, be careful, you know, uh, be smart. You know, think before you do something. So of course, I would you know advise them to uh, be vigilant, be aware of your uh, wherever you're going. So yeah, uh, they would probably blame me for mismanagement, but 
I would, you know, argue about that you know, because um, obviously, because that's the thing about Malay production. If that's your camera, that's your responsibility. That's the Malay, Malaysian way, apparently, which is a, it's a good and bad thing. Like. It's an in-between thing because uh, obviously you, I'm just dealing with this camera, not that camera, because Malaysian producers, they are not educated that way because, which is why I, I, I make, which is why I'm, you know, making this workshop. Uh, I want to teach people how to, um, how to deal with production, how to uh, essentially bring about uh, a bit of a change in the way you think what camera assistants do, you know? Because if you're the first assistant for a camera, you have to understand that you are in charge of all the camera assistants and all the camera equipment. Although you can delegate that, uh, a part of that responsibility to the B camera first AC, but, um, you know, you can you tend to be blamed first. I mean, why did you check? Why didn't you, you know, do something about it? I mean, I've got the B camera first AC over there. I mean, I mean, can't you just you know ask him what he did? I mean, right? So yeah, next question. Do you insist on a black and white agreement with the production that waives your responsibility after stressing about camera safety? especially with China productions. Okay. Uh, I don't actually, uh, but I wish I did. I wish I did that. Uh, I, I wish I did do that with the Chinese production because uh, through my dealings with the production before I went on the job, uh, I, I asked them if, if say you've got insurance coverage, right? And with that insurance, um, if something occurs, um, I mean, it's unavoidable. I've tried my best to uh, keep the camera safe, but stuff happens, you know, stuff happens. I can't avoid it. You can't blame me for something that is, event that is, you know, you can't avoid some stuff, you know, because you can, you can keep it as safe as possible, that, but there's always human error. There's always, you know, mother nature and stuff like that. You can't avoid it. Will I be responsible for that accident then? That's normally the question that I would ask production. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, uh, ask them to do a black and white, but I have done something similar to that. But uh, with that Chinese production, I didn't. Because, uh, well, it's a rushy, rushy job and I can't really, you know, um, in fact, I, I, I signed an NDA, I think, which, which, uh, which, you know, binds me from not talking about the, you know, but I'm telling you because uh, this is a closed workshop, it's, it's not going to be, you know, uh, broadcast all over the world. It's just with you guys. I mean, yeah. Uh, I would try to, I would like to, you know, get that black and white for, for my safety. But, you know, some production, they just say, you know, hey, it's okay. It's a, uh, we shake hands and then uh, if something happens, uh, don't worry, I won't blame you, but we will have to check. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it's not black and white, but it's a shake hand kind of thing. Like, like uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that works because normally it, it's either on paper or, or it's not, right? But if something like that happens, before it happens, I would go and talk to the production manager. I would let them know that stuff like this can happen. Do you want to avoid it or not? If you don't want to avoid it, I mean, I mean, if you're, if you're, uh, oblivious to it or if you if you disagree with me then if something does happen will you answer for it which is why normally if i want to have conversation with production manager uh, regarding stuff like that i would just bring them you know to a place where all the camera crews or or, or the grip boys or the dp is present 
so that they know that this production manager says she's going to take responsibility. So I rest my case there. Next question. Do you insist on a... Oh, sorry. Or is BCAM first assist responsible for everything in BCAM below? Okay. That kind of thing only happens in Malay production, uh, Malaysian production, sorry, uh, Malaysian production. But if it's like a splinter unit, yes, that's, uh, that applies. Uh, splinter unit ni basically, macam, let's say uh, this is the main unit, main unit where all the action is happening. Patu ada splinter unit, B camera tu, let's say lah, ada pergi jalan jauh-jauh, um, pergi satu remote area, tapi kita main shooting kat sana, tapi dia shooting kat sini. Kan? Orang tak nampak, away from people's you know, view. Shoot guys tu, something happens, da, 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 da. it's the responsibility of the first AC. In fact, this happened during strike back. A friend of mine, which I will not um, disclose his name here, because uh, you know, I don't want to embarrass people. But that happened to that friend of mine. I think, I, I don't know if he's here, because he did tell me that he wants to join the workshop, but uh, I don't think he's here. I hope not. But if he is, sorry for telling the story. But yeah, uh, this happened to him. Um, I don't want to go into details, but basically they fell down a hole or something, uh, uh, a ditch somewhere, I don't know. Uh, essentially, they broke one monitor and uh, I think the hand unit, uh, because we, had, we, we were all using this the WCU-4, uh, I think he broke his WCU-4 as well as his uh, TV logic monitor, which, uh, well, luckily we've got LMDs, I mean, and the production is paying for it. I mean, they just consider that as accidental. So I guess they are safe. But yeah, when stuff like that happens, when you're going on splinter units, you have to be responsible of uh, what you're doing. Uh, if you're the B camera first AC or C camera first AC and you're going out there alone, uh, well, not alone, I mean, with your camera unit and your you know, closest counterpart, uh, you have to be the uh, point of call in terms of safety. So yeah, B camera first AC has to be responsible for his actions when he is going on splinter stuff, doing B-rolls or uh, cutaways or stuff like that. Okay. Next question. What are your common advices for evaluating safety that you would give your assistants, assuming they don't have the common sense capacity that you expect because shit happens? <laughs> okay. Um, this is why I normally hire people that I'm used to because they know more or less um, if let's say we're climbing a hill okay and this hill has a lot of pots and holes and uh, we are carrying really heavy equipment um, and then uh, we're handling uh, we're dealing with uh, time we're dealing with um, a whole bunch of you know um, let's say it's a weather thing uh, it's got rain and uh, you know you kind of have to deal with mud so obviously i mean if you're going through a muddy muddy road you you should have that common sense of knowing that you know it's going to be slippery i mean be careful man but i would tell them anyways i would tell them okay situ bahaya sini bahaya you know, stuff like that. I mean, oh, jaga benda tu. Eh, tengok tu, tu, tu. Or, eh, angkat tu. Eh, angkat satu tak apa. Aku angkat lagi satu. Stuff like that. I would, I would normally say stuff like that. I wouldn't tell them, oh, this is a safety issue. That's a safety issue. That's a safety. I won't point them out like that. But I will tell them it's, uh, eh, jangan pergi tu. Eh, ni, 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 ni. Sini, sini. Or, stuff like that. I won't tell them, you know, it's a safety issue because it's got pots, it's got holes, it's got rain, it's got mud, it's slippery, yada, yada. And, you know, 
I won't explain that to them, but if they were to ask me, I would tell them it's because of this. See, because I have no problem explaining myself when you know the the moment rises. You know, if you were to ask me, if you were if you were following me, assisting me on a job, if I told you to you know avoid that, avoid this, don't go there, don't do that, don't do this, and then you ask. Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Why can't I go over there? Okay, here's the safety briefing that you should be getting from a safety officer, not me, but I would, you know, be the one supervising you. But because we don't have safety um, assessment, we don't have safety briefings, the closest thing that my assistant can get from me is that, hey, jangan begitu, hey, jangan begini, hey, jangan buat tu, jangan buat ni. That's the closest thing that you're going to get from uh, me in a production that has no safety uh, assessment. Next question. The LND form for that Long Kang accident was A plus 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 plus. <laughs> well, you should know you <laughs> you were you were still with AFE at the time, so. <laughs> I, I don't know who wrote that form. I, I think, I think uh, the guys in the, uh, that were, you know, that, that had to go through that accident were the ones writing the, the letter. But you know, I, I, I can imagine it would probably sound really funny. Yeah. Any other questions? I think, uh, we, Oh, actually, we overshot by a few minutes. Okay, I think uh, I think uh, I was talking about how to cover. Okay, let's just um, let's just go through uh, a few things uh, under the topic of how to prep a project, because obviously um, most all camera assistants should know that if you are prepping for a project, you should know that. Um, you have to find the right equipment for the right project or the right crew for the right, you know, job, you know, and you obviously as the first assistant, you have to either get the script or get a treatment or get some advice from the production or the DP because for me, before I start a project, I would talk to the cinematographer, I would talk to the DP, I would say, what do you want for this job? I mean, you want, uh, I don't know, shots from holes coming into coming out of a hole and then into another hole which is uh, sounds wrong when i think about it saying it out loud like this but yeah those kind of things you have to ask the dp the cinematographer um beforehand because you have you are the one prepping for for the project you are the one prepping the camera you are the one uh who is scouting the camera equipment who who is going to go to the rental houses to, I've done a few jobs, a few local jobs where I have to go uh, to, the, to the rental company and or talk to the owner or something uh, or whoever uh, to figure out if they have equipments that fit the project. Like say, um, the DP wants the, a, a soft kind of look. I would tell the DP, do you want the lens to, to give that look or do you want a special filter to give that look? Because as a, cap, as a focus puller or first assistant camera, you have to make sure that uh, you take notes, okay? You take notes before you, let's say that's this one scene uh, in, a, in a job I did uh, two years back with uh, a friend of mine and DP uh, Sham, Sham Mohta. Uh, where there was this, uh, there's this one character where he wants a certain kind of filter, but we uh, constantly, not constantly, but we regularly would change between, uh, a, I think it was a black Hollywood black magic one eighth intensity to a quarter or something, one eighth to quarter. I mean, there's a difference between the two because uh, when you're going one eighth indoors with really soft lights the soft light is already adding to the softness 
And when you put a black magic in front of that lens, it's going to look even more soft. I mean, you don't really have to know the really, really deep technical thing about you know, filters or lenses, but you do have to understand that those are the things uh, that would win you over. Because those are the, the knowledge that you should um, you know, learn so that you, know, you can help out with the DP. Because if you know a certain kind of uh, equipment, like say, right now we have a, an Alexa Mini. Uh, we were going to have an Alexa Mini LF. Uh, because I want to, you know, just, you know, show off. Don't really care which camera I'm using, but, you know, I just wanted to show off that we do have an Alexa Mini LF at our disposal, but sadly it's going to Indonesia for a biscuit job. I don't know what job that was, is, uh, but yeah, it's going out. So yeah, now we have an Alexa Mini. This camera, uh, obviously I would have to advise the DP about what this camera can do because I have to, because I am the technician after all, because I'm a camera technician. Uh, although I'm known otherwise, I'm known as the first AC or focus puller, but I am also the camera technician. As a camera technician, I have to know the ins and outs of this camera. I mean, I don't really have to know the, you know, the really scientific stuff. I mean, or how the sensor is made, although I do know a thing or two about the sensor, but all I need to you know, impart to the DP is that, okay, this sensor can do this, this sensor can do that. If you want this, you can mix and match between this sensor and this lens. You kind of have to know that kind of you know, mixture because uh, obviously you've done, you know, you, you've either done many projects uh, that used you know, different combination of lenses, of uh, cameras. You should be able to know uh, if a certain lens or camera fits your uh, project. So in my case, uh, for that job, the, the one that I was just talking about, uh, Sham uh, had me testing a few other filters as well uh, to get that glowing effect from, because the, the, the actress um, is from Indonesia. She has a really tan skin. Uh, it's not, not, not really tan, but it's quite a nice texture. So we were trying to figure out the kind of glow that we can get from that kind of skin tone uh, with the, a certain kind of lighting, a really soft kind of lighting. So I have to do, a, I didn't do much testing. I just do you know, a rough estimation of that test because we only had, I think, a day of prep. Uh, I mean, if we had like a, a week of prep, I would definitely do, you know, test the, the shit of that, out of that lens, you know, or, or filter, you know? But yeah, I did a brief test on the filter and lens, and I essentially report back to the DP, tell him, you know, you can use this or that, you can mix and match some kind of, uh, filter or lens, yeah, I'm rambling. But yeah, uh, essentially you kind of have to figure out the, the, the requirements that a DP wants uh, from cameras, especially, because obviously they are talking to you, you are a camera assistant, right? You have to advise the DP what this camera or lens can do. So yeah, and, that, and then uh, you have to um, find the right rental house that fits your needs, like if, something happens to the camera or if you want to exchange something if you need spare equipment or you need spare peripherals you need spare cables you need spare whatever it is that you need you have to find the right rental house or you know i know that's one rental house that i would prefer it it's the it's afe obviously because they have the equipments that um some of them i I don't want to say that I've personalized some of the in manifest of uh, AFE, but yeah, uh, some of the inventory in AFE uh, wasn't you know really done by me, but I kind of suggested it to Yuan, uh, and then he bought it, and then you know like say this belt here. I mean I've. 
I think I've called Gwen two or three times about this belt during uh, strike back because at the time he only had those uh, uh, what are they the kind of battery what's the the kind of battery that they use for drones the the lipo batteries. So uh, those batteries uh, didn't really work well with me. I asked for a different kind, which is the belt that I just showed you. But you know, uh, UN says, uh, if you want that, then I'll have to buy it. So I said, buy it because it has really good uses. And I'll definitely be getting that belt whenever I go out on a shoot. I'll definitely have that in my inventory which I, I do actually. Every time I take equipment from AFE, I would definitely get this belt for handhelds. And uh, yeah, uh, so basically I'm comfortable with AFE because some of the things that I want, like say this thing here, this thing is actually, it's a D-tap to three pin fissure. It's actually one of my suggestions to Yuan. I don't know, he probably has, uh, he probably had this way before I suggested it to him, but I don't know why the time when I was asking for it, he says he doesn't have it, but yeah. That. So, uh, rental house, script reading, cinematographer, production manager. Okay. Before you uh, go into, um, starting your first move to prep for the project, you have to, you know, make uh, some negotiations with production manager. Obviously, um, you want to know your rates, right? You want to know what they're paying you. Uh, and most of the time, Malaysian productions, they don't really care. I mean, Malaysian feature films, they don't really care for overtimes, uh, which is a problem actually, uh, because we charge overtime not to um, make more money, actually. In fact, we charge overtime is uh, in spite of, actually. We don't want them to, you know, work us up to 16 hours, 18 hours. It's tiring, man. You, you get older, as you get older, you don't want to work long hours. You want to Shorten that hours a bit so that you can, you know, spend time at home with your family, with your wife and kids, or husband and kids. Uh, yeah, so there is a point in time when you have to start negotiations with uh, production. Time tu lah kita nak cari apa ni, uh, the right equipment, the right rental house. Time tu lah kita nak deal, harga kita, kita nak tanya, okay. Aku nak gaji macam ni, aku punya assistant gaji macam ni, third assistant gaji macam ni, aku nak ada VTR, aku nak ada DIT, aku nak ada ni, 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 ni. That has to happen before you start prep. Because if you do that after you prep, then <laughs> I'm sorry to say you, you know, you've uh, dah masuk dalam mulut naga. So tak boleh buat apa by then. So basically, you have to do all those negotiations way before you start prep, way before you start um, calling rental houses. That is the first thing that you should do. So yeah, that's how you prep a project. So uh, I think I've covered most of, uh, actually I've covered all, but you know, in case I missed anything, in case you are still wondering what I'm talking about, you still don't know what I'm saying, uh, do you have any other soalan ke? I, I will open the room to questions before we go into our 10 minute break. Questions, questions, come, come. Uh oh, everybody's sleeping. Hello, Ash.
how long have you been in the uh, uh, in the Zoom webinar, Ash? Hey, it's fine. Just want to let you guys know after the workshop uh, ends. I mean, at the end of the workshop, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to share a link of the whole workshop. Uh, it's gonna be cut in you know moments. It's not gonna be a full interactive version. Um, but yeah, I will share a link to the recorded version. But it's in, it's gonna be in a later date. It's not gonna be as soon as uh, we finish, we conclude the workshop. So yeah, but I will be sharing the recorded version. We're going to the less discussed aspect of being a HOD for any department regardless. Oh, can we scroll up uh, to the... Uh, uh, David choose. I really think we're going to the less discussed aspect of being a HOD. Well, yeah, I, I do have to discuss about that because it's a, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to sound pretentious or uh, arrogant or, or anything, but if you want to have uh, a head of department, if you want the newer generations to, you know, become good at their departments, you kind of have to, you know, train them in that, you know, you can, it's not just about skills. It's also about principles. It's also about your, uh, your uh, sense of duty, so to speak. I mean, that sounds patriotic, but you know, you kind of have to know the facts before you know the works, you know. Do we really have a big role as first AC to decide what other extra equipment we need or in Asia? It's all up to the DP. Okay, and this is a question from uh, I don't know where it's from, but oh, from Ikin. This is a question. Okay, just want to let you guys know uh, Ikin has been my second assistant for the last two or three years. Uh, uh, yeah, she's been very. Uh, I've been very grateful to have her in my projects. Uh, uh, she has helped me a lot. Uh, and now I'm going to answer her question. Because she, if, I, I, if I say any more, she is probably going to blush or something. Probably going to, you know, I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> so the question was, uh, does the first AC have that big of a, uh, say in what equipments or uh, what equipments we can or cannot add on to the, because the DPs would the deep the, the DP would obviously have a, a a requirement. They want this kind of camera lens, you know, combination stuff. But we also have requirements to make that work. I mean, so the DP kind of have to understand. Uh, because normally the DPs that I work with Okay, uh, can you guys hear me? Because we, uh, I think uh, my colleague back there is uh, telling me that my mic is out. Yeah. Okay, so uh, coming back, uh, Ikin was asking me that uh, does the first AC has that big of a say in what equipments that uh, the DP should or shouldn't get? So my answer is uh, yes, because uh, the jobs that I tend to be involved with 
are the kind of jobs that allows me to have that kind of freedom. Because uh, obviously, the DP would have a certain kind of requirement in terms of camera, lens, and you know other combinations. But usually, the DP would you know uh, tell me if you need anything, just list it down and send it to me, and then I'll discuss this with the production or whatever. Uh, and then uh, it's kind of my job to. If say, if say the production manager says that, okay, I don't think I can make this work, you need to find other alternatives. If I can't get a wireless focus, I'll definitely want one of these. An FF4, I think it's what it's called, yes. An FF5, it's a mechanical follow focus. It's a, it goes onto the uh, rails there, where you can pull focus. I think you, uh, if you've never been to uh, bigger productions or done any movies or anything like that, uh, you'll definitely have seen a follow focus, uh, a smaller version of a follow focus. But yeah, the, generally it came from the same idea, which is this thing here. Uh, this one is from Airy. It's an FF5 Cine. I don't think you can see the, the inscription on the thing, but yeah, it's there. It's an FF5. Follow focus. Uh, there used to be an FF4, and then uh, there's an there's a couple more iterations before that. Uh, but each each uh, versions they uh, tend to give different uh, uh, features. You know, like this one. I think this one can you know fit with uh, 15 mil rods. You can just you know take them off, and then you know place them on the because this actually fits the uh, Alexa Mini. If you can, uh, can we get, yeah, yes. The top shot, top shot, baby, come on. Top shot, top shot, top shot. Yeah, okay. If you can see this, these are fit for Alexa's, uh, for most of Alexa's, I think. I think uh, because the Alexa Studio versions they've got really close 15 mil uh, rod uh, combination, um, construction actually, because it's so close, you can place it like that and then, you know, put it down there and, you know, lock it onto a lens and then full focus like that. Back to me. Okay, so, uh, that's the follow focus. Yeah, uh, short answer is yes, you do have some, uh, uh, some authority to uh, decide uh, what equipment fits what project, but you kind of have to work around the budget sometimes, which is why one of the things you have to do before you actually go into prep, prepping the equipment, you have to figure out the kind of budget that you uh, you are getting for your camera equipment because sometimes there are cases when uh, there are times when it's like uh, you go talk to the production manager okay i i want this kind of equipment like say there's a makeup department there's a costume department there's a uh, art department those people are asking for budgets you know they are asking for a certain kind of amount of budget. They want to do this, that, this, that. I want some of that too. I want some of that budget to go into camera equipment. Like say, I want a wireless follow focus. Like uh, if you want this thing here, it's not going to be cheap. Uh, most of the time I would get uh, one of those uh, Nucleus M uh, from Tilta. So yeah, uh, you don't always get things your way, but sometimes you do. Sometimes you, you know, you could uh, argue a really good case against the production and then you could tell them that if you don't get this, you won't get that, you know. Uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes you have, and, but always you have to, you know, work around the budget, work around your limitation. That's the Malaysian, actually that's not the Malaysian way. I, I'm going to stop saying that now. Because all over the world, there's restrictions. There's some kind of restrictions. Uh, because I have some friends from the US 
and the UK, in the, even in the Netherlands, they, they would tell me that the limitations that I have here is the same as they do there. So it's not that much different, see? Because if say you own a camera equipment, let's say you own one of these, right? And you wanna charge production this thing here, right? It's highly, it's highly likely that production is not going to agree with that. Why? Because if you go to a rental house, the rental house would, you know, give you a kind of package, you know, like uh, you can get this for, let's say you want to charge production. If you have one of these and you want to charge production, uh, say 400 a day. Rental house is gonna charge you 200 a day or 100 a day. In fact, they probably won't even charge you for it because you, you are taking the whole package, the camera, the lens, the blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's already in there. I mean, it's, it's technically free, you know? So yeah, uh, sometimes owning your own equipment can be cost beneficial to you and sometimes it can be a waste. Uh, it depends. Sometimes you're lucky. It's really about luck. I mean, because, and sometimes it's the way you talk to the production. Sometimes they agree, sometimes they don't. You know, it's a, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You can't always win. Uh, but it makes me really not want to be a first AC. Ha ha ha. Too scary audio cut. Okay. Okay. Here's the thing. Here's, a, here's an advice from my. If any of you know uh, about my uh, family, my, I have two dads. Uh, one of my dad used, actually both dads were focus players, but one of my dad used to say, if you fail as a focus player within three years, it's likely that you, you are not meant for that job. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that you can't be a first AC or a focus puller. Some people are good at focus pulling, but they are bad at management. See, some people are good at management, but you know, uh, pulls focus like a, a donkey or something. But you can't blame them for their uh, lacking in skills because it's not for everyone. I mean, not everybody can be a DP, right? I mean, you can't have everyone becoming DPs. Who's going to pull the focus, right? Who's going to carry the camera equipment? Who's going to become the DIT or, you know, camera operators or, you know, lighting guys, you know? You kind of have to, you know, realize early on that if the job is for you or not. You know, you, you, th this job is not about being arrogant. Uh, it's not you kind of have to, you know, put your egos aside and then realize that if the job's for you, it's for you. I mean, you, that part, you have to decide on yourself, you know, you either can do it or you cannot. And, and you can't really, you know, push yourself too hard because for some people, um, even after, I don't know, five, six years, they still fail to pull focus. It's not, it's not a bad thing to uh, admit that you can't do it, but it's a shame that you took that long to realize that. Can we scroll down? I think uh, there's more questions. Let me see. More question. Audio cut. Cut here. I can't hear. Sorry. Me too. Maybe my battery is out. Yes. Yes. Can. Yes, I, oh, what's that? Uh, do you tend to involve yourself in the creative process of creating the shots or prefer to stay on the technical side? Who's asking this question? LV. Okay. Uh, good question because uh, uh, some people ask me, I've heard some people tell me that um, focus pulling should be part of the creative process. Okay, let me, let me give you two definitions. Focus pulling is a very technical term. So it's one action, one person doing one action, focus pulling, pulling the focus, you know? But 
when you're deciding where the focus should land, that is the creative part. Because if you want to, let's say you want to rack focus from one person to another, you need to have conviction. You need to have a reason why you want to give it to that person. Because if, say, you did a mistake by, pulling, by racking the focus to someone else, when the director actually wants the focus to stay on him, you've screwed up. So you have to understand, you can be creative if the director trusts you enough or if you know what you're really doing, I guess. But it, it all comes down to how, how much... Uh, how much discussions that you've made with the DP, right? Uh, you kind of have to let them know, okay, I see this happening, you know? I see, okay, here's the action. One person coming to the camera and then another, uh, you know, following that person from the back, you know, from a distance away. And then this person stops. Should you shift the focus to that person or should you just stay in front? So that's the decision that you kind of have to make. like. Let's say this movie is about spies, right? One guy coming towards the camera and, and, and you know, uh, stops in front of the camera, starts realizing, oh, someone's in the back. I think someone is following me. You either decide to shift to the back or just stay there and wait for that guy to come into focus. What do you think uh, is more mysterious or more spy-like? Espionage, you know? What do you think? A, you keep the focus in front. B, you shift to the back. Stay in foreground. I can tell you one thing. It can be either one. Because um, it's like this. For me, the way I, I was brought up, I feel like, if, like you, Ash, I feel like the focus should stay in the foreground. Why? Because I like that mystery. But for some, they want you to rack focus to the back. So it's not about who's right or who's wrong. It's about what fits. It's about what you know, works. If it works for the director, I mean, <laughs> You can't argue, you know. But, you know, sometimes I try a few variations. That's why we have rehearsals, you know. When we have rehearsals, we, you can, uh, you know, make decisions then, you know. Sometimes the, the director during rehearsals, they just want to feel that action, you know. They just want to, you know. Because sometimes you have to understand, let's say, the second guy, let's say this is the, the protagonist and that's the antagonist, right? The protagonist is in front, he's wandering, la, 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 and then he walks off frame. And then the antagonist is in the back. He needs to walk for three seconds to get to that focus, a focal point, right? But, but that's three seconds. It would help for you to, you know, shift, a little bit to the back so that the guy won't take too long to get into focus, right? This is basically, um, you don't want to waste screen time. You have to also think about that. You know, it's not your job really, but sometimes the director would tell you, uh, can you make the focus reach the, the antagonist a little bit earlier? So you kind of have to, you know, play around that, kind of have to have a bit of a timing adjustment. Uh, you have to keep in mind that it's also, um, it's also what I want to say is basically it involves money because screen time is money and money is screen time stuff like that yeah you don't want to waste one or two seconds for that guy to get into focus but you know I like the mystery but can you you know shift it two feet to the uh, background so that the guy would get into focus much earlier so that you can follow that guy all the way out of frame. So yeah, you know, sometimes it's, a, it's more of a, a cost benefit analysis kind of, you know, thing.
Uh, does first, second AC need to have extra personal cables? D type separates in sometime rental house will provide limited cable defect as shooting still ongoing. Okay, uh, good, good question because it's part of my um, how to prep a project uh, lecture actually. Uh, <clears throat> when you're doing your dealings, it's a good practice to deal with production to pay for your personal equipment because you want to get on a job. Let's say I have all these things, like say this floor back here. These are all my investments, right? I've probably invested, I don't know, a few thousands on it, right? I would charge the production according to what I bring. You know, I bring myself my skill. So let's say, let's say I just put there, um, my rate is 800, right? But without my stuff, that's just my skill. You are paying for my skill. That 800 is for my skill. If you want my stuff, you're going to have to pay, let's say I'm going to add another 100, another 200. And then you want my, let's say I'm bringing my wireless follow focus, my own. I'm going to charge you another 100. So it, it all adds up to 1,200 or 1,000. Um, it's around that, right? So you kind of have to charge them according to your um, cost because all this is uh, considered costs. So you have to charge them. You can charge them. You can choose not to, but you, it's a negotiation. You kind of have to talk over with the production, see if they agree. But some, most, of the time, most of the time, they don't agree because they feel like, uh, I think I can provide that for you. I mean, I don't have to pay for those things. Okay, but when the time comes, you can't you know, uh, come up with those stuff. What happens then? You're gonna use my stuff. That happens to me a bunch of times actually, which I then, went, uh, which I then send them an invoice saying, uh, stating that you've used my so-and-so, so I need to charge you this because you use my, let's say they use my tape, my, uh, my recycled tape. Although I shouldn't charge them because it's a bit greedy, but I do sometimes because yeah, I keep those tapes for my own uses. But if you want to use them, why can't you buy them? I mean, you're a production. I'm just a crew. I live as if I get projects, I live that way. I mean, you're a production, you have to be sustainable, right? You kind of have to, you know, have your turnovers, your, you know, revenue, right? So why are you using a small guy's money when you're a big friggin' company, right? So you have to charge them according to your uses. I mean, whatever you bring. So which, uh, in my opinion, if you want to bring your own stuff, it's up to you. You can have your own stuff. You can have your own cables. You can have your own monitor. I bring my own monitor sometimes because sometimes uh, I worry that my monitor would you know, break down or whatever. I have my extra, which I would then tell the production, okay, this monitor broke down. I need a change. I, I need to exchange it. How do I go about doing that? If you can't do it today, can I use my own monitor? But if I use my own monitor, it's going to be costly because you are using my monitor for free. I don't want that to happen. I want to charge you my monitor. Either you get me a monitor from the rental house or you pay for one day using my monitor. But that rarely happens because uh, I rarely get to use... Um, I rarely get to charge them for my monitor because they would say... Um, you know, stuff like, oh, we already paid the rental house. I mean, they can just exchange it. Can you wait a day without monitor? Uh, then I would tell them, can you wait a day without focus? No. So they would, you know, either pay my, because some, some local production, they don't pay for your uh, petrol or your, you know, tolls or whatever. Uh, they, in a way, compensate me with that. Sometimes, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. But you know, most of the time it's either, it's your decision really. If you want to, you can. If you don't want, then don't worry about it.
with actors, actresses. What is your approach on communication with actors and actresses? Nothing. I don't talk to actors or actresses. I do uh, when it's not on set. Because, uh, well, Malaysian actors, they are different. Lah. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about um, um, international stars, I would normally just, you know, leave them be. I mean, wherever they end up, ended up, you know, landing, uh, marking wise, I mean, let's say we put a mark there, but they decided to land there. That's not their problem. That's not even my problem. Actually, sorry, that's my problem to think about. It's not their problem. I shouldn't impose my problems to them, you know, because uh, it could be that's the best, the best performance ever, and you screwed it up by telling them your mark is not there. It's there. You might get fired. You you'd be surprised actually that uh, the amount of uh, power that an actor has on you when you start messing with their work. There are occasions actually, um, I, do talk, I, do, I do however get to talk to the actors. Uh, the actors would come to me to ask me if, you know, is this in range of your marks? And then I would tell them more or less. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into details about it. I would just say, um, don't worry, just do your thing. Just do your thing, I'll, I'll catch you. I, I actually had one uh, uh, compliment. I, I don't really want to boast it, but you know, I did have this one compliment. This guy uh, says that it was, uh, we just did a rehearsal and it, uh, the next one would be a take. But after that rehearsal, he came to me and then he says, I'm not worried. This guy, this guy has my back. That's what he said. Uh, and I remember that every time I do, you know, stuff like improvs kind of stuff, you know, because sometimes you don't get rehearsals. And when you do, uh, you tend to pay attention, which is a thing that I want to I want to express that you have to pay attention when there, whenever there's even, even just, you know, blocking, pay attention because you will never know what's going to happen because through blocking, let's say it's just a rough kind of blocking, right? The director says, okay, you're coming through that door. Kau keluar pintu tu, jalan ke sini, cakap dengan orang ni, duduk situ. And then the actor says, why? I'm angry. I shouldn't go and sit down. I'm angry. I don't want to sit. See, those are kind of the things that you have to hear uh, from the actors or the directors. Those are the things, the, 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 the kind of negotiations that happens on set before you come in, you know, or before the camera is set up. You kind of have to, if you can, try, you know, listen to the discussion or conversation between an actor, director, whatever. Uh, that kind of uh, helps you with, uh, uh, in a way, with the way you want to pull focus because you know that this guy is going to be, you know, uh, walking like a, someone with full of, you know, intent or purpose or anger, you know? You, you kind of, uh, you kind of have this mental preparedness package inside your head where you opened up to, you know, say, this guy is going to bolt through the door and comes to this uh, couch over here. He's probably not going to sit. I don't know what he's going to do. He's probably going to, you know, run around or whatever. So I have to be prepared for that. So the speed from that door there to that couch, you can more or less anticipate, you know? So that's the kind of thing that you have to pay attention when you're on set. Don't, whenever you're on set, don't, just sit around and wait for orders. Look for it. Look for orders or look for something to do. Look for, uh, I don't know, just because you're there to help, not to uh, be ordered around. You are paid to help with the project, not to, you know, if you were paid to get orders, you might as well work in the army. I mean, you're, 
you're in the film industry, you, you're making something that people are going to remember. Don't you want to assert yourself? Because you're going to be the one telling people, oh, I did that job. And then people are going to ask you, really? Which part? And then, you know, you get to say, oh, I pulled the focus. Okay, what's that? Okay, I get to, you know, do this, that, this, that. You get to explain what focus is, uh, which I, I, I keep having problems explaining to people a lot, actually. Uh, but yeah, uh, you want to have that feeling of, you know, um, accomplishment when you tell people that I did this job. Oh, I did this job. I did this job really good. I don't think I can do another job like that. You get me? That's the kind of uh, assertiveness that you kind of have to add to the atmosphere. When you get on a job, that's the thing that you have to do. So in that situation, how? You just leave the bag in the truck or what? In that situation, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand you. What do you mean? So in that situation, how you just? Oh, okay. For bringing your own equipment. Oh, okay. Yeah, I do leave my stuff in the truck uh, if I'm not using it. I mean, it's there when I want it. Uh, if I don't, it's you know, it's just there. I don't, I don't mess about with it. It's just there. For bringing your own. Production is not paying for it. Okay. When production is not paying for it. I just, that's the thing. Uh, it's my own personal equipment. I don't, uh, because I don't have any other obligations, because I don't really uh, rent, the, rent my own stuff as a set. You know, I don't rent my own monitor with follow focus as a set to, you know, some other focus first because I tend to use my own equipment whenever, whenever the job permits. But if it doesn't, it's just gonna stay in the truck or whatever. If, if in any case someone decides to, you know, call me up and says, "Can I rent it?" I would charge them, and most likely I would tell them to come and pick it up, or I'll just send it to them. Uh, it's usually one or two ways. One of one of those ways, you know. Yeah, I think that's about it. I mean, I can talk about uh, own equipment because uh, you have to you have to think uh, about this because Malaysian productions uh, they tend to see the 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 easiest way out if they think that the easiest way out is by uh, discarding whatever you're offering, you have to think about, uh, you know, um, I think I, I just lost what I was going to say just now. But yeah, basically, if you want to um, uh, have your own equipment, it's up to you. Uh, uh, nobody's going to tell you different. I mean, if you can make business with it, go ahead. I mean, if you... Uh, there are there are actually uh, one or two DPs or focus players. They 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 buy their own equipment, and then they uh, place those equipments in rental houses where those rental houses can rent them out, and then you'll get your money back. Uh, you know those kind of deals. You know, and you know it's up to you really. I mean, if you want to do that, go ahead. I subscribe to the idea that if it makes my job easier and funner to do by having it, I can sell it. I'll get it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I do it too. I do that too. I mean, if I can afford it uh, and I can afford to pay for the repairs if I damage it during that job, that which is not being paid for, and, you know, I mean, it makes my job easier. I mean, it's up to you, really. Yeah. If you want to, you know, dip your wireless follow focus in a lake, not being paid for it too, uh, it's up to you. I mean, it's your, uh, like I said earlier on, 
as a first AC, you are responsible for everything that you do and for whatever everyone else under your command does. So it's up to you. If you're the first AC and you have five camera assistants working uh, with you or for you, whichever, uh, whichever is, uh, you know, describes your uh, job position, uh, it really is up to you. I mean, if, if you want to do it, you know, do it. If you don't want, it's, you know, nobody's going to kill you for it. Because it's depressing sometimes if you don't have that thing. Yes. Again, if it helps you do your job better, then do it. Don't, don't, don't restrict yourself out of uh, how do you deal with equipment insurance. Okay. Equipment insurance. Okay. Production wise, I don't really deal with it. I normally would just, you know, uh, talk to the production. What's the story about equipment insurance? Do I have a say in it? Do I, how do I, um, how do I go about uh, um, making sure that the equipments are insured? Maybe they can show me like a written um, letter or something that says, I don't know, equipments are covered. You can do whatever just as long as you abide by a certain set of rules, which is why actually we need safety officers on set. Because safety officers, what they do is basically they give you a guideline on what to do on set. Uh, they do those risk assessments based on the, your explanation, what you explain to them. Okay, this is the scene, this is the location. What's going to happen? Most likely, they're just going to ask the DP for uh, information regarding the camera setups. But uh, sometimes they would come to you, uh, is this what you normally do? Okay, let me give you my advice. This is the safety officer speaking. Uh, let me just give you an advice. Maybe you don't do this. You can do that. Uh, would that work in the sense of uh, what you're trying to achieve? If you say yes, then that's your guideline there. If you follow that guideline and then you enforce that guideline, that guideline can become, when you, let's say, you already followed that guideline that the safety officer gave you and an accident happens. You go talk to that uh, safety officer. Okay, this happens after I followed your guideline. What are we going to do? The safety officer will more likely help you in the sense that uh, if you want to make a report uh, regarding an accident, they're going to write a report, uh, a citation maybe, uh, and then you can use that to claim the insurance and you are more likely able to claim insurance using that citation or report rather than, you know, writing an LND report actually, because that's uh, I've consulted one uh, safety officer. His name is uh, Villa Marimutu. He told me exactly that. Uh, he says that the, there's this one occasion where this one safety officer, he got into an accident in Malaysia. We, they were shooting Marco Polo or something like that. I, I can't remember the story. But yeah, the safety officer got into an accident, uh, but nobody wrote any report or any citation apart from Villa. He wrote one report and then uh, he kept it to himself. He didn't, uh, he gave it to the production, the production didn't do anything. He just kept that report and then, you know, it's just in his files. And then a few months later, this guy, the safety officer goes back to his country, uh, goes back home, trying to get the insurance, uh, trying to get uh, insured for, uh, um, medical expenses, I think in the hospitals there. Uh, but the hospital, uh, no, the insurance company says, no, we can't insure you because we don't have any details regarding the accident. Can you show me a report? I mean, you're a safety officer. Uh, do you have another safety officer that, that can vouch for your accident? And then it clicked to him. It, 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 he remembered that Villa wrote a report about that accident. And what he did, he called up Villa, asked him if you have that report. The good thing about uh, um, occupational safety and health 
is that it applies to the whole world. The, the acts, the laws, it applies to the whole world. So if this guy from Malaysia writes a report and says this didn't certify that accident as legitimate, sends that report to the insurance company in uh, Ireland or whatever country that this guy came from, it's going to be valid because it's a, his, his signature alone is certified all over the world because of occupational safety and health. So you see, you see where I'm going with this, right? Uh, it's this, this is why you need safety officers because they can uh, help you when you need it most. Because sometimes an accident happens, it's not your fault, but you know, production, they, they'll just you know, point fingers. I mean, it's your, it's your equipment. What are you doing to protect it? It, it's, it just got into an accident, where were you? Right, so the function of a safety officer is that to protect you from those kind of discriminations. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to lose your job. You don't want to lose your reputation, stuff like that. You want to, you know, keep it clean, so to speak. And if there is no HSO, okay, no HSO. What can you do? Uh, well, not really much, actually. Uh, it's sad to say this, but yeah, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been, I mean, doing, I've been shooting feature films in Malaysia for, for years and years now. Uh, and most of the time we don't have safety officers. The, the closest thing to a safety officer we have in Malaysia is the stunt guys, uh, which they, even they don't know um how safe is that danger you know well we do have jpam but you know i i don't think they're they're certified osha people not osha what's it called it's a dosh uh dosh is department of safety and health i think is what it's called dosh so what you really need is someone with a green card from DOSH. Not j -Pub, not, you know, anyone from any other sectors or whatever. You need someone from DOSH to help you with the, uh, you know, safety assessment. Because those are the things that you kind of need to, you know, have your job uh, safety approved, so to speak. But yeah. So uh, I think I want to go into a 10 minutes break because I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I want to give you sort of a quiz for you to answer. Uh, I want, I, I just want to try it out to see how it goes. I hope you all would try to answer it as best as you can. I mean, uh, I, I'm not expecting anything, but try to answer as best as you can. Uh, let's uh, go into a 10 minutes break uh, and then we'll come back in uh, 6.57. Okay? Okay, welcome back everybody. So, <clears throat> uh, how do you guys find the uh, polls questions? Uh, 
you feel like uh, we should do it uh, regularly throughout the whole workshop or you feel like it's silly i have to tell you that it's a requirement from finas that i have to do it to uh, so that i can uh, um, get that into my final report <clears throat> Is everyone back in yet? Okay, hey guys, uh, uh, now we're back. Uh, we're moving on to the uh, next topic, which is, uh, well, basically, we, I want to talk about uh, writing camera reports, um, um, <clears throat> uh, missing and damages uh, reports, and uh, inventory so uh, as you all know second assistance um, semua kena write reports why because uh, camera reports is basically for for production houses uh, sorry uh, for editors for camera assistants for script supervisors to use as uh, as reference during editing or you know post production work lah basically so the reason why camera reports exist uh, was when we were still in uh, we were still filming in film uh, during that time we make the report so that um, we can keep track of uh, film stocks we can keep track of uh, um, um, what's it called? real num uh, sorry uh, magazines uh, lenses what whatever we were shooting on the day we have to report it why because say there's one magazine camera magazine a film camera magazine um, from that magazine has a lot of scratches or hair inside the gate. And what you do with the camera report is basically you jot down uh, every detail, uh, detailing from, uh, uh, yeah, and short ends, detailing from uh, the magazine. Some people would write magazines as well. And uh, um, the film stocks, um, lenses and uh, a bunch of other details but those are to keep track if in case there were um, some mishaps you know um, let's say la gambar tubuchala where did it come from was it from this magazine or that magazine if we write that detail inside the camera report we will know which magazine to either avoid or replace or fix. Um, that's how we keep track. The, the camera reports are there exactly for that. And for editors, uh, they use that for, as a reference to edit, you know? So because uh, essentially uh, in the film strip, it's uh, there's this thing where the counter, basically the counter and everything. So the counter, uh, it reflects the, the magazine has a has a uh, what do they call it? It's been a while, but yeah, the, the magazine has this uh, film counter that counts how many feet had running, you know, had ran, and how many feet spent and stuff like that, so that we can uh, 
uh, use that as a reference for editors to, you know, whenever they want to cut something from the um, from the uh, process film uh, that they got from the labs to, uh, well, basically in the lab itself, they already embedded some some time code details, some details like that, su such uh, those kind of details for editors and well, they're not present in the rushes, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because it's been a while. I, I haven't seen film rushes oh, for 12 years now, I think. I think the last time I saw rushes was in 2012 uh, when I did KL Gangster Duo. Um, that was the last time I uh, saw a film. So, yeah. But Nowadays, with the digital um, digital cameras, the 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 thing that we write down in camera reports are basically clip numbers, um, ISO. Um, sometimes we keep track of the uh, recording media, like say, I have here. Um, yeah, like say, this card here. It's a good practice actually to when you wanna when you want to record details such as cards. You don't because the cards don't really uh, show any details such as uh, um, I think they, there's probably some serial numbers, but uh, camera assistant tends to mark these cards with uh, their own. Uh, designated numbers or um, um, alphabets, like say A1, so to speak. Uh, and then if say the footage that they offloaded into the JIT cards or the, the data wrangler cards, uh, and they found um, some corrupted files or, and it's consistent throughout the same card, we will then use the camera report to identify that problem um, to stop it from occurring again. So basically, camera report ni dia memang untuk kita guna as a uh, it's like a liability thing lah. You you want to give a sure answer to someone lah. Okay, why does the let's say lah, uh, God forbid, uh, gambar tu um, corrupt, corrupted that, right? and then it came from the same, the very same card. Right? Every time they datang the card and sama. Right? So what do you do is that obviously production will blame the camera assistants first. That's where where they blame first. Uh, you, back then it used to be uh, film, uh, film at the scratch or whatever. And uh, back then, kalau every take they will ask you to check the gate, which you will then, what you will do is basically you will take off the lens or take off, uh, open the door on the side, I forgot the name, but door on the side of the camera to check if there's hair or there's dust, whatever, uh, so that they can confirm with the AD, the, the AD will shout, check the gate. And if the first AC checks the gate, uh, it's clean, they will just say, uh, good check or good gate, stuff like that. And then the first AD will then uh, confirm to the director, okay, good gate, print, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so uh, with digital era, we, I've, I have heard some people, you know, shouting out, uh, check the gate and stuff like that. I mean, nowadays, if you want to check the gate on a digital camera, yeah, you can, pull out the lens and check the sensor and stuff like that. Or you can play back the footage and see what you see, you know? Sometimes you can't see um, imperfection in the heat of the moment, but you will definitely find something once you've played back the footage. So, which is why they will call out, check the gate, you check playback, you check uh, the lens, the sensor and stuff like that. If you find something, say back gate or you know, bad check or whatever. And then uh, the AD will then go over to the director. One more, that's 
bad game, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, you keep track of uh, my best advice when you're writing a report. Uh, back then we used to uh, take into account, uh, we used to write down uh, which magazine that we're using, not uh, film stock, but just magazine and film stock. So we can keep track which film stock is, uh, because sometimes, because in Malaysia, we don't really have uh, a cold storage room for in feature, in feature films. We don't really have cold storage rooms to store the films. Sometimes they just store in the van and the van is, you know, out in the sun. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit risky. Actually, it's too much of a risk. Um, yeah, but they do that. And, you know, if you keep track, uh, uh, those things, if you find problems, you know when to avoid them. You know how to avoid them. Like I said, uh, the best way to be the best at what you do is by learning from your mistakes, not repeating your mistakes. Not, you know, if you've done something, admit it to yourself, be responsible about it, clean your hands of it, done. Uh, admit it. I mean, if you you don't run away from your problems. That's the main thing that you have to understand. You can never run away from your mistakes or your problems. You have to admit them. It's a, it's a really good practice because um, there are many occasions where I've done something wrong, like say frame rates or you know uh, stuff like uh, involving uh, focus or or maybe I didn't press uh, maybe I didn't push record or something like that. I would then admit to the uh, the DP or camera operator or the AD that sorry I didn't roll the camera and maybe or the frame rate was wrong. It was uh, let's say we were pre prior to that we were filming in fifty frames or hundred frames. And then going into that next shot, suddenly, you know, when you're shifting into so many different frame rates, you tend to uh, make a mistake. So the best way is that uh, the best way to, you know, gain people's uh, confidence in you and trust is by admitting when you've done something, something that is wrong or bad, not wrong, bad. Um, yeah, Be, uh, own up to it, you know, don't, don't, don't blame it on other people and don't blame it, let's say, faulty equipment, don't blame on faulty equipment. It's more, it's more likely that the equipment failed because you failed to check it. or maybe during your first checking, uh, maybe you noticed something, but you thought that it was, you know, it's just a fluke. It's, a, it's not a consistent thing. And you decide that uh, it's fine, I, I, I can live with that. And then suddenly on the day of the shooting, uh, something happens, you blame on the equipment. No, that's the bad practice for a camera assistant because it's your job to make sure the equipment's run perfectly. But if there's human error, admit it. Admit that it's human error, it's your error. Admit that it's your mistake. Learn from it. Don't do it again. As simple as that. I mean, what's so hard about it? I mean, I've, I've admitted mistakes more than I, I've cared to remember. But yes, I've done a lot of mistakes. I mean, by doing that and admitting that I've done it, learning from it um, makes me a better person, makes me uh, a better focus puller or a better camera assistant because in a way kita punya kesilapan is the best teacher that's the thing so about camera reports again camera reports is basically something that you have to take into account you have to um, write your frame rates write your ISO write your uh, um, there's this section, there's a few, there's a, there's two sections of a camera report, which you have to fill out. Uh, one is more important than the other and, you know, stuff like that. 
the, there's a heading section and there's a, the body section. The body section is where you write all the details. If you, if you look in the chat, uh, you'll find I've uh, inserted uh, two PDF files. Uh, one is, um, is actually a sample uh, that I made. It's not, it's not the, uh, because it was a rushy thing. I, I, I just did that last night. Uh, yeah, if you can see, uh, you don't believe in what Oh, uh, and and poll. Huh? That up, right? Oh, believe buka. Share kat dulu. Share screen. Kalau kita just share screen and then we transfer. Tak tak, kita just uh, buka je kat desktop. And then kita just uh, share screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you can see on the screens, I'm sorry, I, I, I tried sending uh, there, were, there are two PDF files, one of which is this, and the other is actually a template for camera reports, uh, for a camera report. <clears throat> if you look in this uh, uh, example, uh, this is from, uh, oh, this is from Strikeback. This is from eCamera. Uh, yeah, eCamera is in second unit, the same unit that I was in. Uh, if you look in the camera report, there's a heading section uh, where you can see take two and then uh, details of production company, production title. Um, and then uh, I think there's a, you can write names in there, I think. Uh, ah, yeah, there's a second part where you write camera operator name and stock and stuff like that and all those things basically there's a, a lab instruction camera and number camera operator emulsion and roll number stock and code number these are actually um, from the take two lab it's take two i think it's not a lab per se i think take two is i'm not i'm not really sure um, what take two does. I think, I think uh, some of you might know what take two does, but yeah, uh, it's a common practice for, for a production to take uh, um, camera reports from the lab that they are going to send uh, the footage to. Why? Because uh, it's their template. It's uh, easier for them to understand from that. Uh, take two was a rental company in UK. Yeah. So basically, that camera report, uh, that camera report is, uh, is, uh, is this, we normally would take camera reports from uh, labs or back in the film days, we would take camera reports from the lab so that we could, uh, you know, so that it's easier for the lab to understand. Uh, and then the lab would, you know, uh, most likely give you instructions on, uh, how to write the report or stuff like that because uh, some 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 editors or some uh, um, labs would have their own certain um, requirements for reports. In Malaysia, it's not a requirement really, but nowadays editors are starting to ask for camera reports. Now they are they are understand, starting to understand the function of a camera report, uh, which is, I think, a, 
is a good thing because in a way for us camera assistants it helps us to do reshoots or because I, I've had occasions a couple of occasions where I've had to do reshoots and the only uh, guiding uh, in a way guiding medium or basis that I, 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 I'm, I was basing on for the reshoot was the camera reports. So camera reports is not just for post-production. It's not just for labs. It's not just for script supervisor. It's also for the camera assistants to use when they want to, uh, when they need uh, references. And it's also for the VFX because sometimes you have to jot down if you, uh, can we show them uh, the the other one? The the yeah, that one. Okay, if you see if you see on the screens, there's the uh, this is a template that I made. It's a it's a it's a very simple template. It's not it's not accurate, but you can add to that. So this is uh, basically a template. I can make a proper one for you. This this one is not a proper one, but I can make a proper one for you if you like. I'm sure I understand. Oh, no, I'm not talking to you. Okay, so I can uh, basically, okay, if you look at the camera report now, this thing is, uh, is to show you that what you do on the report, it doesn't matter what you do, just make sure you get all the details, all the, if it's a constant detail, if it if the this uh, if say the ISO is consistent, the uh, shutter angle is consistent, the color temperature is consistent, just write in one spot. That's fine, but if there's a if it if there's a change in uh, let's say you've got a change in ISO or a change in frame rates or a change you know in anything at all, you can add in the remark section or you know if the remark section is too small for you to add any details i don't know someone's it's probably a bird or something i can you know. so uh in the remark section is where you add details such as you know vfx stuff distance and uh, if say you want to want to add details regarding um uh let's say you've changed lookup table. So you've changed the exposure a bit or something like that. And you want to add like push one stop or, you know, push two stops or one stop down, stuff, stuff like that. You can do that in the remark section. Okay. So camera reports, uh, it's, it's a really simple thing, but it's also tedious because I hate doing it back then. Uh, and I believe, I think uh, my assistants also hate them, but I find them writing the reports quite, you know, um, quite fast. They, they, you know, because they do it every day, they, they learn how to make it really, really quick, you know, uh, which is a good thing. Yeah, set report is also helpful. I mean, you can use app. You can use whatever you like, as long as you get all the details. You, uh, the details are, you know, um, uh, sent across clearly, and people gets to uh, get that um, information, the the right information. As long as the information is correct, it's fine. You can you can write them on a, on a piece of card. You can write them on your hand take a picture, send it to post-production, it's fine. As long as you get all the details right. So a camera report is, uh, it's, it's like a, it's like a binding contract between you and post-production saying, okay, this is exactly what happened. So if something's wrong there, uh, then, you know, it's either you or we did something. So, you know, because of that report, it becomes a, it's like a, a guiding material for you to find out if there's a problem somewhere. If post-production finds a problem uh, unfixable in post or in the lab itself, we'll most likely go back to the camera. 
or the cameras, whoever you know knows what happened. So yeah, the camera report is there for for our references. So if you can write camera reports, uh, I'll send you I'll send you uh, in your emails the, uh, the the two examples for you to. You don't have to use them. You can just you know take them as a guide. Uh, for when you want to write camera reports. I mean, camera reports are straightforward, man. You just, you know, write scene number, scene number, okay, scene number is one thing. Uh, scene number can, uh, tends to be a bit complicated for some people. You want to know why, because there's the American way, there's the UK way, and then there's the Malaysian way. The Malaysian way is, actually, it's not Malaysian way. It's some, quite a lot of a, Quite a lot, of, a lot of other industries apart from you know UK and um, or Europe in general and America uses. There, there are a few variation of formats, but uh, I think the best to avoid complication because Americans they they tend to um, have a, a certain way of. Um, labeling each scenes they they put some codes over it not not code but you know like a identification number for a certain scene and then for the uk they just you know uh, the script supervisor would you know come up with some well not i don't want to say convoluted but you know their own version of you know uh, slate number but we can do that ourselves as long as we understand it post production understands it and uh, script supervisor understands it or continuity and understands it as long as the message is you know known um, production wide so whatever you want to write on the camera for all the slate number for that matter uh, as long as you understand it they understand it it's fine you can do whatever you want but Make sure everyone is in, is in the same page, on the same page. So uh, yeah, that's camera report. I think uh, um, yeah, I think that's not really much to cover about the camera reports because camera reports I think is the most simplest things uh, there is. Uh, but if you write them, uh, if you you know. Uh, did a mistake in the report and then suddenly you know someone starts you know screaming about oh i didn't find this clip number in here uh, how come it's on the report that's you know that's where you can screw up when you when you you know write something wrong in the report and it's not in the um, the hard drives or whatever uh, that's you know you you're going to be you're going to get screwed for that but yeah, it's 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 a very simple thing, but it's easy to you know get wrong. So although it's simple, take it seriously. Okay. So next thing, uh, uh, if you have any questions about that, you can just post the question. I'm open to questions. If you have any questions about camera reports and why, or do we even need them? Okay, let me just answer the questions that I just asked myself. Uh, why do you need them? Because, to put it simply, production, uh, post-production people now are asking for it because they want to use that as reference when they edit. So, camera reports is a must. If they don't want it, it's fine. Write it down. Write just very simple details like uh, scene number, take, clip, whatever, you know, and then uh, you use that as reference when you want to reshoot or just in case it's a VFX shot. Uh, no one says anything. No one wants camera reports, but you kept one. You'll be that hero at the end of the day that saves the production from, you know, screwing up or from accidentally having to have reshoots. So well done, hero. So let's talk about... Uh, Missing and damaged reports. I think, well, missing and damaged reports. Uh, I, I don't think I have the. I don't think I sent. 
that but okay i don't have a sample for that actually I, I i do have a sample of that on paper but i don't have that um on the pdf but uh i can send you two types of uh, missing and damages but both are pretty much self-explanatory i i don't really think that i i need to explain in detail but what what those things are for is basically uh to get authorization for you know if you want to um because for for rental houses or production houses they they want to have a uh, like a verification or confirmation that this thing happens and you know because they want to claim insurance and then uh, those are the things that uh, supposedly helps with the, the claims so damage reports are for that and uh, i'll send you those as well uh, camera reports and uh, sorry uh, damage reports uh, it's a pretty simple thing and uh, I think inventory. Inventory is a, it's a headache and it's a nightmare if you mess up. Why? Because imagine you have about a uh, hundred different things. Like say, if you look back here, this camera has a bunch of different stuff. Like, if I want to point out cables alone, cables alone, uh, I think about, I don't know, a good 15 cables on this camera. So uh, you kind of have to keep track, but uh, the best way is by using, because when you, when you get equipment, uh, you most likely have, I mean, every rental houses do this, uh, they'll give you a copy of equipment list like this yeah uh, i'm not I'm definitely not, not gonna see that maybe on this camera can you oh, oh. Ah. can you can can you ah yeah there 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 it is that's an example this is actually a kit list from afe for all the equipments that you see in the background here uh in behind me all these things well they're not on these two sheets but they are however in uh we do however have uh, a bunch of them uh lying around here somewhere i don't know where it is uh but yeah so uh these things are for us to actually use to keep track for equipments when let's say you lose one thing like you lose one antenna right uh for me because i have my own stuff i bring my own stuff to uh, for prep i would change let's say let's say i want to change this antenna right here i think you can see that there so these are two different antennas, right? Some people can, you know, lose them so easily. It's just silly, you know? I mean, just keep them in a box if you don't use them, right? So yeah, antennas are, you can either lose them or break them. Either way, these will go, these things will go into well, they don't go into, you know, L&Ds, loss and damage report, because uh, it's so inexpensive. I think, uh, uh, I think I'm right on that, right, LV? But if you, you know, mess up something uh, as big as this, this is a Teradac wireless receiver. If you break one of these, these things will definitely go into the damage report. But yeah, uh, these things you can keep track using uh, these higher sheets or equipment lists. So yeah, it's helpful to keep. And if you lose them, make sure every time you get one, uh, 
print them or you know uh, scan them turn them into a pdf or something like that keep them somewhere uh, make copies or backups of it i mean like how you would um, you know footages you know so uh, equipment lists are a way for you to keep track your equipment another thing uh, regarding inventory is your uh, your uh, expendables like this uh, hold on this tape here these are what we call expendables or uh, what's the other word there's there's two there's expendables and there's um, oh my god there's expendables and consumables yeah these things are uh, stuff that you will, you know, use until you have to throw them away. Uh, these are re recycled, by the way. They, they, these have been with me for more than a year. I don't know how long, but yeah, more than a year. These tapes and uh, tissues and sometimes these, these and these, these are stuff that, you know, you tend to, uh, you definitely, you know, use them until you run out and then you just buy new ones. These are, these are lens liquid, lens cleaner liquid. Uh, you use them not with this tissue. This, this tissue is for uh, filters or stuff other than lenses, because for lenses, you need to use something more softer. Uh, it should be something with a softer touch. But if you use, it, use them on filters, it should be all right. Should be fine and stuff like this. These are, these are what we call dual locks. Uh, well, we don't call them. It's, uh, it's, it's the name of the, the thing, actually. It says on the back here, dual lock. See, I think you can see them. Can you see them? Yes, it's there. Can you focus? Yeah, there. It says on the back there. It's dual lock. If you wanna, <clears throat> you can, you can either get production to buy them, or if production can't buy them, you can buy them themselves and you know claim it back from the, get the production to reimburse you on you know uh, uh, expendables or consumables. Um, that's the easiest way, I think, uh, for you to get what you need. Because sometimes production, they don't, you know, um, they, don't, they don't bother to buy them for you because some of the things, some of the things that I list down or my second AC would uh, make a list of, they find it uh, rather um, surprising, so to speak, because for some reason, they think that the things that I'm asking for is actually uh, only available in different countries. When in fact, you can buy them here. I mean, so so easy to find. Or you can just you know open up Lazada or something like that, and you can find them there easily. You can buy them there. Yeah, inventory is uh, uh, one of the things is about consumables is that it's. Uh, Thing where you and your second second assistant would you know plan on because consumables are stuff where say you're on a five week job right five weeks job you need a supply of spray cans and stuff like that and the production let's say you want five of them or you want two of them every week or three of them every week uh, but production can only give you one week. So what can you do to counter that? You get this blower. Yeah. See? This blower is uh, the easiest way. I mean, if you're cleaning lenses, you don't really need um, these uh, gas sprays like this, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's actually worse because it, it's got um, moisture and stuff like that. And 
you kind of want to avoid having this uh, flowing into your lens or the sensor for that matter, because I've, I've had occasion when I have to clean my sensor and I don't want to use this because it's quite dangerous actually, because you might scratch the, uh, you might scratch the sensor by doing, by spraying into the sensor. So you will have to opt this. So blower it is, it's a must. And uh, I'm out of uh, sensor cleaners. I, I do have this one, uh, uh, this one package, I forgot what it's called, but I'll share the link or share a picture of that uh, in the emails as well. Um, I use those things to clean the sensors uh, and it works on any sensor because the thing is, you're not really cleaning the sensor. You're actually cleaning uh, the uh, IR filter over the sensor. So basically that thing actually works on glass because if you look at the sensor, the sensor is not, uh, it's not really made out of glass. I mean, the, the surface of it, uh, so to speak, because the sensor itself is uh, it's basically like a, an electrical diode or, well, basically a photoreceptor. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a glass. The glass part is actually before the sensor or after the sensor. But yeah, it's at the, essentially this thing here, there's a lens mount in there, there's a, which I'll show you in detail later. Don't worry. Uh, there's a, a bit of glass in front of the, in front of the sensor, that thing is the infrared um, filter. Well, I mean, for some cameras, but some cameras, they just put some clear glass over it. I mean, it's not really infrared, but yeah, they use that to uh, essentially to convert, well, not convert, sorry. They use that to filter out any infrared pollution, like the magenta kind of uh, um, tint. I mean, I'm going to, I'm, I'm now going really technical into the sensors, but you know, that's what uh, it is. But yeah, those sensor cleaners are actually not for sensors. It's actually for those glass, those glass that protects the sensor. It, it, because the, sen uh, the sensor, if you want to clean them, you can't do it yourself. You have to get someone, or if you are trained uh, to clean them, then it's fine. But if you're not, don't try it because you'll definitely get it. So don't clean the sensor unless you're trained to. But if uh, you are just cleaning the infrared uh, filter, then it's fine. Like for red cameras, I think uh, red cameras, you can take out the uh, OLPF filters or the uh, infrared filters uh, and you'll find the sensor there. And I think Kinefinity cameras also has the uh, same kind of same kind of uh, construction where you can just access the sensor directly. But yeah, so consumables, camera kit, camera kit, keep track, keep track of your equipment uh, as best as you can. And the best way to do that, the best way to keep track your, of your equipment is if you have a bunch of, when you prep, you have to think what you want to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Hari-hari kita bawa keluar kamera. Tapi hari-hari kita pakai kabel yang extra. So, jangan hari-hari bawa keluar kabel extra tu. Keep all those extra things in one box, or in one mag liner, in the truck, uh, and then, yang kita nak pakai hari-hari, like this, this whole setup here, this is most likely my setup every day. So, I'm going to keep this setup like this. I will not take anything off from it unless I need to. Or I need to change something for, I don't know, setup reasons, uh, for configurations. Then I'll do that. But until then, I'll just keep, keep it as it is, you know. So uh, yeah, that's it about uh, inventory and uh, consumables. Uh, 
I don't know if you have any questions on um, camera reports or inventory or uh, damage reports, which I'll send. I'll send the damage reports, and I guess if you want, I'll send the inventory. Uh, I mean the kit list uh, to you as well, so that you can use them as a reference, I guess. But yeah, the 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 um, loss and damage report is self-explanatory. You don't really need uh, that much of explaining because it, you can just read over it and then understand as quickly as possible. It's a simple math. There's just satu form. You write satu detail, barang ni hilang, time ni hilang. And then get signature, dapat signature, hantar production, dah. Done. Or in AFE's case, uh, the best practice is ambil benda tu, hantar terus kat AFE, dah. AFE akan settle dengan production or insurance. Habis cerita. Any questions before we move on to our next topic? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about how I prep my camera package. I think uh, for most people, this is a, a mystery to some, I think, because some people find uh, prepping cameras is a pretty simple thing. And some people find that it's quite complex. Why? Because uh, you have so much stuff. For me, for I don't know for everyone else, but for me, this is, uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, is the most, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a working kind of setup for me, I think. Because uh, this has everything that I need and one thing that I will most definitely never have. I think uh, if you look, uh, we're gonna have a shot of uh, a close up of this camera, uh, which we will show you okay, shortly. Hold on. Okay, there you go. If you look here, you'll find that this is rather odd because uh, for most people, they will never find this in any local production because even me, myself, I have never used this on local production. The first time I've used it uh, was during Sprite Back. And the funny part is I don't even use it. I mean, it's there, but I don't use it. Uh, and the DP was uh, telling me that, do you really need that thing? And I told him, no, I don't even know why it's here. I mean, uh, but I just put it on because I don't want the production to ask me, we rented this thing, but you're not using it. So why are you wasting money? So to avoid that, sort of confrontation, I might as well just, you know, just put it on there. I don't have to switch it on and just leave it there. But for this demonstration, for this workshop, I added this into my configuration uh, because I want to, you know, show you that these type of things are actually here because some of you might have never seen this, right? This is, this is actually called a cine tape. It's from the company called Cinematography Electronics. It's the same company, I think, that makes the uh, Bartek, if you've ever heard of that. I think, I think I'm think i not wrong there. If I am, uh, forgive me, because I tend to forget stuff. But yes, 
a cine tape essentially be, uh, what it does is uh, it's uh, well it measures distance it's a it's an ultrasonic sensor that sends out um, signals uh, bayangkan kelawa dia terbang dia buat bunyi dia boleh detect dia punya uh, ultrasonic sound tu dia macam uh, sonar kan so Like I said, this is the sound. Patah balik. And that amount of, that speed of the reflection of that sound is, uh, that speed is what the computer inside that thing use to calculate the distance. The distance to speed. So the speed of that thing to the distance of the, so basically it measures uh distances uh in a nutshell right so uh, is focus bug popular yes actually uh just not here uh actually focus bug is popular in the us and currently it's entering uh, the chinese market i think uh, because i saw one uh chinese production i think not china chinese It was Hong Kong, I think. Hong Kong or Taiwan, somewhere. That they they use focus bug because uh, because focus bug travels uh, in these type of cine expos kind of shows where they you know you know bring products to demonstrate their whatever. Uh, and one of the uh, those expos are uh, were in China, uh, and they use they. Well, basically, they, they got a chance to introduce that in China. So uh, I think in Asia, China is probably the first one to use uh, focus bug in Asia. If you don't count Australia but, and Japan, I think Japan was the first com uh, country that used focus bug. But yeah, I'm, a, I'm an avid focus bug lover, but basically. I like focus bug. Uh, I like the, the the kind of innovation that they uh, they are uh, they are promoting. They are offering. Uh, imagine you put a sensor about this big. If we see the panel from the top, so, okay then. If you see here, which we will show you in a moment the sensor is about this big you put this the fun part about this sensor is that you don't put them in your uh, shirt pocket you put them in your you know trousers in your pocket right what it does is basically it sends instead of this this is a one way uh, one way transmission right It sends out signal and then it comes back. It calculates the distance to uh, speed, uh, and then. Uh, but with the focus bug, it uh, it's a two-way kind of system. That's this sensor here. Uh, you can let me just show you. Let me just take it off. Okay. If you look here, which we'll we will show you in a close-up uh, shortly, this thing here is a sensor. You can see these two turrets. What it does is basically it focuses that signal out, outwards into, say, this camera right now. It, set, it sends this one wave, sound wave, to that camera there, right? What it does, the moment that thing reaches back to the sensor, because it's so one way, you know, it goes one way and then comes back in this way or in vice versa. So what it does is it measures the speed to distance uh, ratio. From there, it uh, basically calculates that, this, uh, that speed, turns the numbers into, turns the serial data into distance values. So For focus bug, it's a two-way kind of system. 
what it does is basically uh, it sends out signal uh, and it can take signal from a different source. Like when I said the sensor, imagine this sensor here. This is the sensor that the actor is wearing. And then this is the focus bar. What it does is that as it's moving, it's sending um, sonar signal, ultrasonic sounds to the sensor. And it detects the sound and measures that sound in speeds of the return, the return speeds, and turns them into uh, data that you know, comes out on your display or whatever as distance. Like, let me just show you this. If you see, you, uh, you can try to get a close up on this. Okay. What it does is basically whatever passes in front of the sensor is gonna, it's gonna change the values on the display here. And if you're using an airy camera or any camera that takes uh, serial data, like this thing here, if you can see this cable here, uh, if you can see this thing here, this thing here is basically taking this data, this, uh, this thing here, it's sending out serial data into this converter. This converter goes into the camera. And what it does, it's going back and forth to send data into a hand unit like this, uh, which I, I will demonstrate soon uh, or later. Uh, it will show you a distance data on this display here. The same data that it shows right here. Like right now it's saying 19 feet and eight inches, right? If I move my hand in front of the sensor, see, it's saying one feet, 11 inches. And this thing here will show you the exact distance. And there is a, there is a thing up here, there's a, Okay, let's go back to the close-up. Okay. Okay, there's a... I don't think you can see that because it's... Uh, that I think you can see that button there. What you can do with that, with the focus bug, if you use this, it's going to activate focus tracking, uh, which I think can actually perform as uh, essentially autofocus. Imagine that. The world of focus pulling. Everybody thinks autofocus using uh, focus bug and uh, C motion and um, WC4 and Preston is uh, is uh, is the future. Everybody thinks that autofocus is the future, but no. Uh, in my opinion, no. You still need focus pulls because uh, unless you can, you know, get a really clever AI to think the way humans think then, you know, we are here to stay, you know. They have something similar for stage lighting too, for the automated follow spotlight to always be on the target. I'm not sure if that one is Sonar too. Okay. Uh, in that respect, I think it's laser because they, they do have uh, uh, this kind of technology, the, the same one that Preston has. Preston uh, has the uh, Light Ranger 2, I think. Light Ranger 2 and Light Ranger LR or something like that. It's a lighter version of the Light Ranger 2. Um, the Light Ranger 2 uses a grade 1 or grade A um, lasers to measure distances. So it's if you've, if you've ever played golf, uh, golfers, they use this uh, type of uh, range finders, which use lasers, which you can detect the, the, the distance from where you are to, let's say, well, I don't know, golf uh, from, let's say, let's say this is T1 and you want to check how far is T, I don't know, T5. And then you use that laser to check the distance and then we'll display the distance inside the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, viewfinder. 
it's essentially the same kind of technology. In fact, the army in the US are using it as well. It actually, I think the, the technology that Preston uses is uh, they, I'm not saying, I don't want to say borrow, but they probably got this, the, the idea for that uh, kind of technology from the, uh, the army, the US army. So <clears throat> yeah, they are using lasers now. So I think, I think what you were saying is, uh, uh, is lasers. Uh, they're using lasers. They're not using sonar because you have to take into account uh, with sonars, uh, it can be interfered with by other sounds. I don't know what kind of sounds because you have to understand when you're in a hall, if you're using sonar, you most likely, you know, detect someone else screaming or something like that, or it might bounce off something and then comes back to your horns and then it reads a different data. But yeah, let me just uh, tear down this camera and I'll show you uh, why my camera build is this way. I'm gonna bring this camera on the Magliner and I'm gonna show you my process to build this camera. So I'm gonna switch off everything on the camera. I'm gonna switch off the camera as well because the camera has been on since uh, this morning when Hanif was doing his uh, uh, VTR uh, workshop. So this is the battery. This is the thing. This is the, the most important thing that you will most likely have a hard time to judge is how much battery is enough battery. How much batteries do you need for a, let's say you're on a, you're on a very tight schedule kind of shoot and you don't really have time to, you don't really have time to charge your batteries. And so it's a, it's, it's like a run and gun kind of shoot. And you kind of, need more batteries, you need more batteries, but you also need to charge them. But if you can't find a place to charge them, then how do you, how do you decide on the batteries? And because you have to take into account, you have to lug them around. You have to carry, nak kena bawa ni dalam bag. Sometimes my ACs would either letak benda ni dalam floor bag, dalam floor bag ni, for, for them to carry around like this, uh, this is definitely going to be heavy because you have a whole bunch of stuff dalam ini. and then uh, dengan battery lagi, dengan ni lagi, and then assistance have if you're using WCU for you will definitely have to carry around these batteries and then these batteries are you know I tend to carry these batteries myself I would because I would have a, a pouch with me this pouch this pouch I'll have, uh, you know, I'll put my batteries in there, but you know, I'll talk about that later. So yeah, how I manage my setup is basically, there's, there's a, I wanna say three key components. You need monitoring on the camera itself because uh, sometimes when you're shooting where you're on a tight schedule, the VTR guy can't, you know, set up the monitor quickly enough. You'll definitely have to, you know, mount a monitor on the camera itself for uh, either the DP or director to see, to watch from. So this is the monitor. Uh, it's not a pretty looking monitor, but it's a, it's a monitor. So you, you know, basically have, I have it attached to this thing here. It's a quick, it's a quick release thing. So basically this thing here, it's a quick release. Uh, I forgot what it's called actually, but it's a, it, you use it to, you know, uh, take it off and put it back on as quickly as possible. Wait, hold on. I'll show you, I do have, one that is not mounted on the camera. 
uh, I'm, I'm basically I'm showing this for those who never used them before. Tak pernah jumpa, tak pernah tengok ke apa ke. I have another one. I actually have uh, three of these, I think. But yeah, one of it is on this thing here. Uh, this thing here, I use it to. I use it to. Yeah, there. I use it to mount the this thing for the uh, the sensor for when we're going on gimbal. See this thing here. When you uh, we have a gimbal back there, actually. This this setup is for the gimbal. It's gonna go underneath the camera and it's gonna be mounted this way. When you're on studio mode, this is what we call a studio mode or a, I don't know, sticks, but I call it studio mode. When we're going on studio mode, I would most likely mount it like this. Right? This, is, this is basically top mount. I call this top mount. And then when, when I'm going on the uh, gimbal, I'll do this sort of uh, low mount. It's gonna be mounted this way, as opposed to this way. This is studio mode, gimbal, or handheld. Or this is handheld and this this is gimbal. This is studio gimbal. No, this is studio handheld and then this is gimbal. Okay, so pretty simple. If you you know, see, easy as that. No sweat. So that's how I make things uh, easily releasable okay uh, if you can see here this is where i mount the uh the quick release things uh quick release plates yes plates quick release plates this is where i put them this is how quickly it is so <laughs> see how easy is that see okay so take these off Two things off. Now I've got uh, these other things, cables. Sometimes I route them. If you if you look here on the side here, you'll see that. Uh, hopefully, we'll get the close up soon. Okay, if you see here. I've got most of my cables tucked in. Apart from this cable here, this is the monitor. This is actually the cable that will most likely be coming on and off the camera uh, quite often. Because if, say, I were going on a, a gimbal quite often, the setup from studio mode or sticks, whatever you want to call it, uh, to a gimbal setup, you, um, I, will, I will try to, you know, get my setup as uh, as manageable as possible time wise because i don't want to waste time to take everything apart and then put them back again to switch modes because that's time consuming and uh, well <laughs> people will hate you for that back then uh when early on when i was a camera assistant i used to do those things i mean i used to uh, take these things apart and i was I don't want to say I was so good at it, but I was quite good at it uh, to a point that, um, well, I can do it so quickly, you won't even notice it, but it's, you know, you'll definitely notice it. You'll definitely notice that I'm doing stuff so quickly. Sometimes people can hear uh, stuff, you know, hitting the magliners uh, top deck here. Like stuff like that, you know, it'll drop stuff. Uh, it's a, it's a not a good thing actually to drop things, and uh, you have to take into account when you want to go handheld. If you want to go handheld, you're gonna need a very light setup, a very tight setup, because you want that setup to be as manageable as possible. Why? Because uh, imagine you wanna go somewhere really tight like it's so tight that uh it's so tight that 
you don't really have much space over your head, right? So you want to, let's say you want to have a camera set up that's so low that you won't hit anything above you, right? So see, so easy to move around and there's nothing hanging about, well, apart from these cables because I, you know, took them off, but yeah, it's so easily manageable and so clean, right? And now I want to show you what I normally would do with my wireless focus setup. If you look here, we've got two motor drivers, right? So there's this one controls the focus, this one controls the iris. If we have a zoom lens, which is gonna be a bit longer than this, because normally zoom lenses would extend this far out, it's, I don't know, a few inches out uh, on smaller lenses, we would have another motor to control the zoom. So, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's quite a, it's quite a rare thing actually because you know um, on typical Malaysian production they tend to just use their hands because you know why you want to let someone zoom but you know some directors they want to be involved in the shot so what they do is they probably get the focus blur to sit down next to him and so that he can you know, move the zoom rocker or whatever, because on a WCU, you'll get this uh, thing here where you can you know, move around the zoom up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. You're probably falling asleep by now. So yeah, zoom rocker. Okay, so the main thing about a camera setup, say you've got, uh, you know, in when, you were, when you're prepping for a project and you notice that the DP is saying that, okay, we have a gimbal, we have uh, shots that are handheld, we have, uh, we're gonna have a dolly, we're gonna have a crane, or we're gonna have, you know, all sorts of setups, right? Uh, what you're gonna, want to prepare is that make everything as uh, as uh, almost permanent i guess put them in a place where it won't bother the operator or you know yourself because uh if you're using a camera like a an alexa SXT or an Alexa Plus, the, the, the studio version, the longer version ones, those cameras tend to be, one is heavy. It's a super heavy camera. Uh, and then the other thing is that those cameras, they, uh, they've got this on the side that, uh, the one where we call the dumb side. Back then we used to call it the dumb side. But now uh, it's called, uh, it's also known as the AC side now. Uh, back then, it's called the dumb side because on film cameras, it's just it's, it's nothing that on film cameras on this, the 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 right side of the camera it depends on if you're if you're standing from the back of the camera, that one is the right side and this one is the left side, right? The one where this is the hot side, the, the where the viewfinder is, the hot side is the operator side, and this side is is now known as the AC side. Why? Because on Lexa cameras, SXT or Plus or Classic, whatever, they've got this display on the side that where you can control the uh, settings on the camera. So it's called an AC side because that's the only place where ACs can have access to when you want to change uh, settings. But well, today you don't need to do that because you've got uh, uh, apps like this Alexa Mini. Now you can you just use apps on your phone. Uh, you can connect to the IP address to uh, 
you know, control the settings or whatever, camera system settings. So yeah, these things should be tucked away as neatly as possible. Uh, try to, why don't we, uh, can we have a close up on the thing here? If you look closely, there's one very important thing. This thing here, this cable here, this cable here is attached to this uh, battery plate. What it does is, you probably can't see it. Let me just take it off so that I can show you. Ooh, it's very tight. Okay. Let's see. Okay, see, see how, uh, if you were watching, see how easy it is. I just disconnect two uh, DTAP cables from the DTAP uh, splitter here. And I just disconnected these two cables that is going into the camera to, well, essentially to take it off. Right. So you, you have to keep in mind that whatever setup that you want to do on your camera, make sure it's easily accessible and it's easily taken out. Because uh, again, you don't want to waste time on camera setup, right? So, <clears throat> okay, I was, what I was saying is this cable here, it goes right here. It acts as an hot swappable system where when you want to change batteries, like say this battery here, you attach it to here and you want to hot swap. Let's say there's another same, same type of battery. You just put this DTAP over here. See, it connects like that. It's, now it's acting in a loop. It goes on and on, but then, you know, it's not really doing anything, but yeah, it still, it still has power. I'll demonstrate that shortly, but not right now because it's not connected to the camera, but yeah. You want to change the battery, take this, connect it, take this off, take this off, pocket, it goes, done. Battery easily taken out is the best way. Why? Because you want to have really good access on the back of your camera. And then you have to make sure that you can make as much room. Like for this camera, it lacks some mini. Uh, you kind of need the space and you kind of need the accessibility so that you can, because on back here, for those who've never used an Alexa mini, there is in the back here, a door where if you push this lever down, you get access to the, yeah, there you go. That's the card there. Okay. Okay. And then you put the Mac in, but you don't really have to, you know, do this process. You, you don't really have to go through this process of taking off the bat battery plate uh, every time you want to change the card. You can just slide them back because it's on the rails. It's on the rails here. You can see that. You can just slide them back or push them forward to tuck it back in. Because you have to remember, you have to keep the, you also have to keep the center of gravity uh, much closer to the, you know, to the center as possible because you want to have a very balanced um, fluid head when you're operating. You don't want to, you know, stress so much on the, uh, the hydraulics or the springs of the fluid heads. Because you want to avoid having to, you know, uh, add more friction to the heads. So yeah, that's that's the uh, battery setup. And if you look over here, we've got this thing. The uh, look on top of here. This is where. This is all the. Uh, footage we'll go through. See, this is the uh, Teradek 
um, Bolt 3000. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's an old model. I mean, well, it's not really old, but it's like, I think five, six years kind of old. Uh, it's been a, uh, it's been around for a while, and uh, this, uh, it's quite reliable. This thing, and uh, what I do is I touch them on the camera body. Uh, it's it's only on the cam on the top of the camera body. It's because I've got this on the side. This uh, cine tape. Cine tape ni pun makan space. Ayo. See, see that thing. That this thing. Let me show you a quick dimension lah. This thing is that big, bro. Oh. See how big that is. It's got a uh, a dual lock on the back, which I then attach to this thing. This uh, makeshift plate. This is a well. I think uh, the community in in the small rig community they call it a Franken rig. I think it's a. Uh, if you look here, it's a. Uh, see, it's see. You can see that this. This is something that's not included in this uh, package. This thing is, uh, actually I borrowed this from EFE, from Dane EFE. Uh, he gave it to me to use it for this demonstration. I don't have this thing. I don't own this. Uh, I actually have a different type, but I prefer this one better than the one that I have, which uh, I'll most likely be using this kind of setup more often. But yeah, this is essentially what uh, what I would prefer as a setup because I have a plate where I can then mount this cine tape on here. Now, you are probably wondering, what about the cables? And how do you manage the cables? Well, I can tell you one thing. In a job, I would spend, I don't know, if you ask my assistants, I would spend uh, many a days perfecting the cable um, routing. I would, uh, every day I would change the setup until I find the, the you know, the sweet spot, so to speak, of uh, cable management. If you see here, I, I also have a, uh, there's this thing I bought from Small Rig, I think. I can't remember where. Yeah, I bought it from Small Rig. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, yeah, this thing here. Uh, this thing here holds this 15 millimeter rod that supports these two lens motor. Okay. So this is my almost usual setup. If I have a different configuration, I would definitely, you know, I, if I have a different but better configuration, I would definitely go for that. But, you know, for now, I would settle with this kind of setup. This is actually a pre-planned setup because I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, make my setup as tight as possible. I, I spent, nearly a whole day trying to set this kind of setup and it's uh okay i'm trying to get this uh cable this power cable in i'm not going to go into too much details as uh, uh, for what the the cables do what this does that this does that will that, that. Why? Because, you know, if you guys have, uh, uh, you can just, you know, if you want to know what this or that cable does or what this rig does, you can just email me. Or if you have a prep and you need me to um, help you with the prep or something, you can just, you know, email me or call me or text me. I could be there and help you with the cable management or if you want some help uh, picking out a uh, kit it's it's really simple i mean that's why you need to scout uh, 
rental houses. You need to find a rental house that can that best suit your needs for uh, certain projects where you know sometimes you need uh, like this thing here, this this cable here. You you can just pick out any TV logic cable and just just fit just jam it in there and then use it as a, as a hot swap cable. You know for batteries. We call that a hot swap, by the way. Uh, when you want to change the battery, but you don't want to switch off the camera, we call it a hot swap where you, you know, jam it in there, take a battery, uh, take it off, slam that battery back on there, and then it's on. So, yeah. And uh, the lens, obviously, this is the lens. There you go. This is the lens. Yes. There you go. Okay. So uh, I think uh, I, I just want to, the reason why I want to cover this topic is because I want to show you uh, that you shouldn't overcomplicate your uh, camera setups. Like this is, <laughs> this is way complicated than I would you know, normally do because this one has a uh, cine tape and uh, well, that, well, I don't know. For me, without, even without the cine tape, it's not too complicated, but I don't know for some, maybe it's too you know, elaborate. And I, I just feel like this is the uh, compulsory setup for me because uh, yeah, you know, and I would normally opt for this matte box. Why? Because if I were to do mostly studio shoots, I would definitely, definitely go for a six by six matte box. Why? Because the uh, the top flags and the sides, it's uh, it's much better than uh, this clip on matte box because this clip on matte box only has the uh, top flag. The top flag is okay. I mean, uh, you still need to use stuff like, like these. You know, when you want to chop off any flares coming in, which uh, I have to say, uh, if you like to know how I got this thing, uh, it's because of my good friend David in the uh, in the uh, chat room there. Uh, Probably what what's he saying? There's an entire Instagram meme account about bad cable management on camera department. Well, it's not something to be proud of, but you know, some people just have bad management with cables. You know, but, but you you need to keep in mind that a good looking camera is a good looking camera. So always make sure that you have. Uh, everything tucked in, you know, semuanya tersusun, uh, and then uh, cable semua tak uh, huru hara. Kan? Kenapa? Sebab, uh, ya lah, kalau ada benda terjuntai, and then, let's say lah, kita lalu kat tempat yang ada banyak branches apa benda semua, and then sangkut. What happens then? Nah, cable sangkut lah apa benda ni semua. Ah, kecoh. So, <coughs> Lens dah masuk, matte box. So, okay. Now, you have to remember, this only happens after you've got this whole, oh, got the monitor. Monitor goes on there. And then there's a, okay, this VNC is not going into a permanent position because uh, it's, well, it's uh, mutable because it's, you know, when we're changing setups, I will want to take this out as easily as possible. But uh, I do it like this because on the gimbal, which I will demonstrate tomorrow, I think. Uh, yeah, which I will demonstrate tomorrow uh, how I would prep for uh, gimbal work uh, is a... Uh, why I put it like this is because there's this uh, one port, one SDI port on the side of the uh, uh, 
there's a triangle, uh, there's a square of a cage where on the side there, there's a, there's an SDI port where I can plug in the BNC cable coming from the camera into that SDI port for the gimbal operator to have monitor feed on the gimbal rings. So what's your approach on setting up small body cameras like the A7S, BNB and C6? That's a space to rig such which would seem to be a known these days. So what were the <laughs> okay, well, who's asking this question? Chikit. Okay. Uh, uh, am I pronouncing your name right? Chikit. A simple yes will do. Kikit. Okay. Kikit. Kikit. Uh, uh, this is, I think, smaller cameras is, uh, for me, is, well, it's not really a challenge, but it's uh, an interesting, an interesting kind of setup. Because I, I did this one independent movie last year, uh, where uh, we were using a, an S1H camera. Uh, my... My second AC at the time was uh, Ikin. Uh, she helped me with the build, uh, which we actually spent a number of uh, days and hours, actually, not days, hours. But we, uh, you know, we would regularly uh, try to find the best kind of uh, uh, camera build for something as small as an S1H, right? I'll show you the picture. I think I took some pictures of that uh, build. In fact, it's in my Instagram, I think. I can't remember. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find a picture. I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you tomorrow. Um, and then you tell me what you think. Because, uh, <laughs> because for me, the build uh, looks uh, pretty similar to a, a cinema camera kind of uh, build because it's the build, the camera is about, I think it's about this big. It's about this big. And then the, the rig extends from, from here for the lens and mag box and then with the battery uh, plate in the back here. So it's quite long, the, the, the build. Why? Because uh, of balance, because the, the, the movie, uh, actually, I do have a picture of it. I'll show it to you later. But uh, basically, the setup is quite long because we wanted to have uh, a good balance of, uh, uh, of the camera so that the operator would you know, have a better time handling the camera. Because the camera, small, with smaller cameras, the problem is you tend to, even though it's a wide lens, you tend to get the camera uh, to look very shaky when you're operating it. So uh, to avoid that, you need some weights on the back. But sometimes uh, some operators like the weights to be on the front. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a decision-making kind of thing which you kind of have, discuss, have to discuss with your DP or operator. And uh, hey, actually, David knows this. David, David was on that job, actually. Uh, he seen my setup uh, at the time. I mean, I, 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 tend to, I tend to make the setup so, uh, well, not complex, but you know, so elaborate that it looks like a cinema camera. Although it's just, uh, although it's just uh, a very simple, uh, kind of setup because we were shooting almost every I think almost every shot was handheld apart from uh, there were one or two scenes that uh, were done on a tripod but most of the scenes were handheld so we kind of have to make a rig that it's that is handheld focus uh, as opposed to tripod because we rarely took out the tripod I mean every day we took out the camera it's handheld uh, if it's a fight scene, it's handheld. If it's uh, sometimes it's just you know uh, a family just sitting down and eating dinner, it's handheld. 
So we have to make a handheld, um, a handheld focus setup. And I came up with that setup because it's, a, it's the kind of balance that my friend, David, the DP, also David, but he's, a, he's from Spain, not, you know, not like uh, David Chu, the good looking David Chu who just lost weight actually. Uh, uh, my friend, he uh, basically wants a camera setup that is, you know, I think he, I think he did request that that setup to be front heavy, a tiny, a tad bit of front heavy. So we left the weights uh, more, a tiny bit more on the front side so that he could have that weight, you know, so that, because he he's apparently he's quite excellent at operating with long lenses handheld he's quite good actually and uh, yeah he i guess in a way he uses that weight as leverage for his hand so that he could you know whenever he wants to go over a pothole when he, he needs to make the steps you know longer he can just use that as a you know guiding uh, reference for in terms of gravity you know want to fight back the gravities kind of thing. So I'll show you the picture. Uh, I can keep talking about it on and on and on, but you'll definitely want to see the picture. I'll show you that in a moment, okay? But for now, I want to show you that. Imagine if I'm building this camera from ground up, right? I would have to start from the tripod. Okay, I will have to check the tripod. Like, say, this tripod here. What I would do to test the tripod's health, but well, this is not I what I would normally do, but I would use it to check its, uh, you know, uh, strength. This is what uh, a heavy duty round foot Baker tripod would look like. It's uh, the 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 limbs are quite uh, thick. It's about that thick. If you if you were it's about that thick. If you were to go for a lighter weight, it's about uh, I think that big. It's so small. It's about it's about the size of your eye waist. I think. Yeah. So what I would do when I want to check for the health, I would try to sit on it or stand on it. Okay, I won't stand on it, but I will definitely test the uh, the strength of the locks because sometimes you want to have a camera set up on a steep slope or really high. You'll need a very reliable tripod that can withstand weights. So you tend to have to test weights to, to put your weights on it because most of the time, if you're judging uh, the weights of the camera and what the tripod should be able to withstand, it's roughly about 40 kilos or 35 kilos around that you know, area. Because this setup alone is probably about 15 to 25 kilos. And then this head is probably another eight or 10 kilos. I might be wrong, but uh, yeah. So I would say roughly this whole setup here is about 40 kilo, I don't think it's 40, probably less. Might need to uh, measure that. But yeah, so tripod, check. Head on it, check. Camera, check. Camera, I already, already showed you how I built it. So yeah, let's just consider that as a check. And you have to remember when you wanna build the camera, you have to make sure what you're building um, give the operator an ease of use. The operator must be able to feel comfortable operating the camera, not feeling constricted. Like if you have a, an operator who likes to use a, a viewfinder, right? He's gonna be he's gonna be you know tucked into the camera. He's gonna be really close to this. There's a fan back here. He's going to be really close to that fan. He's going to be feeling the heat of that camera, right? So 
what you can do either you know extend this out because you can extend the viewfinder out and you can you know keep them away from the heat right okay uh so you've built the camera congratulations now uh what's next what comes next is actually all the other things the peripherals the the the, the receiver the like this receiver that i was talking about uh you have to make sure it's working it's in working condition you have to, to test it because you have to remember although your responsibilities are the camera and the accessories we also have to make sure the video signal that you're sending out is uh you know what the uh video guys need you know so let's go into camera settings i think uh, not the most fun topic but you kind of have to know okay if you look here i think can the camera zoom any closer no no okay i think uh i'll need to bring the camera closer so that so that you guys can see the menu structure the camera system so how about that oh i still can't see a thing maybe i can help with that how about that yeah can we zoom any closer no maybe we can bring the camera closer okay my point in showing you this thing is you should know the most important thing that you need to set up because the rest like uh like for some things such as uh am i seeing this one? okay like for some things they are they are basically uh like frame rates like frame rates and iso and stuff like that uh those those are the very very basic things that Those are the very, very basic things that uh, we should set up. Right. Okay, let me just show you. Hold on. Okay. Okay, one thing to keep in mind is that the most very, the very basic of setup is that, uh, yeah. So <clears throat> this is the most basic. You have to make sure the codec, okay, you have to remember, uh, like in the camera report, you have to remember the codec, the resolution, project settings. Okay, let's go to resolution. Okay, let's start again, recording codec. We've got 42LT, 42HQ, 444. Well, you can find the, these informations in the internet in fact there is there is actually um an application in airy website in the airy website where uh, you can simulate uh, the same kind of uh, menu structure that you probably have in um that you'll probably have on the camera itself where you can have um 
Well, essentially, you can practice the menu structure uh, on the website. They have that on the website. So here's you've got uh, you've got every raw ProS, for XQ, HQ, photo two, blah de blah, and resolution you've got for this camera, it only extends up to three point two K and four point uh, two point eight K four by three. But we are currently at OK UHD project settings. This is where you set the frame rates. Uh, real number or roll number. Uh, camera index is uh, if you want to, if you're, you know, if you want to change it to B camera or C camera, this is where you do it. And uh, camera ID prefix is basically if you're doing a multi camera uh, production, this is where you set it. Either you go, oh no, camera index. I think I got this wrong. Oh, wait. Oh, the, oh, I see, prefix. Well, uh, it used, this camera ID prefix used to be, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's either, either center, left, or right. But now you've got all the letters in the alphabet. So yeah, let's say it's R, R for right. And squeeze factor, if you must know, squeeze factor is for when you want to shoot uh, anamorphic at 1.2, 1.3 times squeeze, you set it to that, and or 2.0, 2.0 times squeeze, and you set it to that. Like the uh, Atlas Orion lenses, where you can use two times. Um, two times magnification and you can use a four by three 2.8 K settings or okay or you can use the anamorphic for with four by three 2.8 K or HD anamorphic or two three nine is to one two K anamorphic either one and Set it there. Go back to recording. Record more. This is uh, I mean, not really important unless you're doing intervals, like uh, time lapse stuff like that, stop motion. And this is the uh, tally light. You can switch it off. This is beeper. Beeper is actually the sound that it makes once you press record. If you can hear that beep, okay. Okay, that's the sound it makes. In case you've never, I think, I think most of you have seen Alexa Mini uh, in life, in real life, and most of you, I think, have worked with Alexa Minis. But yeah, the most important thing that you have to set up is the recording section. You have to make, make sure the moment you switch the camera on, these are the things that you need to set. And then uh, media, you have to insert the card, erase it, you know. Um, these are the second important things, the EVF, the frame lines and stuff like that. Okay, and then system settings, sensor. These are, these are the least, important things. And yes, uh, I see David saying, can you save these settings as a profile in a USB stick and load them on a new camera? Very elaborate question. Very, very elaborate question. Uh, yes, you can actually, you can, you, you know, uh, go into the, uh, there's this uh, app, I think in, on the website where you can set the whole settings of the ARRI camera, for, for ARRI cameras, uh, like for Alexa minis, you can have, a, you can set them in that application, download them into a USB stick, load them to the back of the camera where the, where the CFast card that I just showed you came from, load them in there, and then, Go to, I think, 
if I'm not wrong, prepare USB, please insert. Yeah, I think that's where you go for it. Or I might be wrong because sometimes I don't. Yeah, there you go. User setups installed or user setups on USB. This is where you go to uh, load those uh, pre set up um, settings, pre sets onto the camera, and you can use those as presets. And there you go. This, this is the look. You can change the look, the classic, and whatnot. And if you want to find a look that's not on the presets, you can just press add and then find a different one or from a USB stick or but we don't have it, so that's all right. Configuration. This is this is one of the things that you kind of have to check because some people would overlook recording processing log C. Make sure you, if you want to go to post production for color grading, make sure you go for log C, not look. If you overlook, you. Uh, asking for a screwing, yeah. And you can leave for EVF and SDI on look, that's fine. Color space is also another thing that you have to check because this has happened to me, not to me personally, but on a job that I was on, one of the cameras was set to Rec 2020 and my camera was set to Rec 709. And the director was having a hard time trying to judge whether it's the monitor's problem or the camera's problem. And then, well, I, because I got on the job uh, pretty late, so I decided to check the settings of the camera because, well, I don't want to, you know, you know um, insult the first AC for that camera. I just you know want to wanted to make sure that uh, well basically when you want to check someone's camera it has to be because you want to make sure that you're not doing something wrong, right? So as it turns out, the first AC for that camera was doing something wrong with his camera. I see a question when I prep lights, I often do a factory reset on the lights. Skyframe, is it not recommended to do that? At the start of prepping an Alexa, good question. That's normally what I do most of the time. Uh, going to set, uh, just going to factory reset is the easiest, the not easiest, but the best way to you know start from scratch when you wanna when you wanna you know start uh, dabbling with the uh, camera system. Yeah. You should start with factory reset, but uh, if if you see the camera um, more or less, you know, it's not really much changing. If you're on a one or two days job, I mean, it's I mean, it's just a one or two days job. I mean, quality should come first, but uh, sometimes you don't want to get lost too much in the camera system settings. Like say on a red camera, a red camera you can easily get lost in. So if you want to avoid uh, getting lost on a, a camera system settings, you should, you know, if it's a one or two day job, you, you can, you know, uh, not do the factory reset. But if you're on a long form, definitely do it. I think... Uh, because I don't want to go into too much details as the uh, for the camera system settings because uh, we're not really um, doing an airy camera uh, review per se because after all this is a focus puller class on the camera system it's not for airy cameras. Any questions so far? I would love to answer questions. I'm all big on questions. 
If you don't have questions, uh, I want to take a 10 minutes break uh, where I will uh, post another uh, poll for you guys to have a look, see, and you can, you know, uh, answer the questions. And I think I saw before, like in the Alexa, you have the preset different, the preset. Different FPS and shutter speed sets. Not sure what you mean, but uh, I think I saw before like two preset different FPS. Ah, okay, 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 okay. I got it. I got it. Well, Normally, those uh, I would try to go. You have to take into account. Uh, this is the thing that you you most likely uh, would you know come encounter with uh, when you want to set up the camera system settings. You have to ask the production or post production because this this is the things that you will most likely um, have discussions about. Um, at the beginning, before the, the start of the production, uh, you will ask them what frame rates, uh, and if we're going high frame rates, how high, how fast do you want to go? Or if they want to go slow, like an undercrank, how slow they want to go? Like, uh, let's say 12 frames, like 24 frames, half of that is 12 frames, right? So if you want to go 12 frames, and you know, I could I could set the the preset, but normally I would just you know, if there's no other special requirements, I would just uh, set 24, 48, 96, and 120. I think after that, after that is nine. Um, yeah, 130 or something like that. And shutter normally. I would, yeah, like, like, as you said in the, the chat box, uh, 172.8, 90, 145. I, I've never used 145, but I've used 45 before. Do you double check your settings at the start of each day or is that your assistant shop? I normally would do it myself because uh, it's not that I don't trust my assistants. It's just, I don't trust the camera because, uh, there was a time, there was this, well, this normally happens with cameras that has those IC kind of, a, what's, the, what's the battery called? The CR123 batteries that they used to, uh, to power up the, the, the it's, like a, it's like a clock timer inside the camera. And that battery is to keep the timer on the cam, inside the camera running. Uh, cameras with those kind of a, a system, they tend to uh, run out of battery and sometimes the camera settings, you know, get reset uh, all over and then you kind of have to do, you know, settings like that. It's a, it's a good practice actually. If you, every day on the job, morning, switch it on, warm it up, uh, check the settings, make sure everything is copacetic and, you know, it's a good practice because, uh, if you don't do it and you end up uh, facing a problem during a shoot, it's going to be a tiny bit of a problem for you because you, you are either going to be having a bad day <laughs> that day or, you know, the, the worst amount of bollocking you can ever imagine. Yeah. Because it's a bollocking worth, uh, you know, action. Yeah, because you you know you go out on the field you don't you don't just bring your guns with you know two magazines you, know. you kind of have to bring the whole you know arsenals to you know, go into war or something like that yeah c r twenty thirty two or something yeah you go okay any more questions? before we go into a 10 minutes break. Hey, actually I promised the uh, dinner time. 
I think we should take a 30 minutes break for you guys to have dinner. Uh, how about that? Remember that day on Coast Guard, we got screwed over by the glass fuse in the wooden camera. v mount plate. do you carry glass fuse for you now? Glass fuse. <sighs> okay. I normally don't do that. I don't carry on my on my persons. I don't carry the uh, fuses myself. Normally, those things uh, either my second assistant would have, or because these things. Because I think what you're referring, to, yeah, the, the 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 wooden camera box, the 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 ones on the battery that that it's a battery plate mount here. It has a fuse inside. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, there's battery, there's this battery plate has fuses in them. So that fuse actually, you can either get them from uh, the rental house or if you have your own, uh, it's a bonus. But you know, I would prefer because those things, you know, if you change them, there are, there are either two things. Uh, if you use the wrong ones, because you have to remember those fuses. It has to go, it has to uh, be able to withstand the amount of current that you're using. Uh, like it or not, you kind of have to find the right fuse. And, you know, because I'm lazy, I would, you know, normally, because those are very little things that, you, you know, will get you, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the most trouble. Those little things will get you in the, the most huge trouble ever because you're gonna stop the whole production from shooting because of one fuse, imagine that. If only you have a bunch of those same fuse, because the thing is with those fuses is that it's not guaranteed because when, sometimes when you change the fuse, uh, sometimes it doesn't work. It's probably because of cable, because you have to remember, um, the only reason why the fuse would be blown out is because of one of the cables that attaches to that fuse holder is not soldered properly. Most of the time it's because of that. So if even if you change the fuse, you're gonna have to check the cables. So that's why if something like that happens, I would normally just, that's why I said you, I think I said it before. Okay, I'm saying it now. You will have to have spares everything. You need spare cables. In fact, sometimes I would go out and shoot with spare battery plates uh, because I want to avoid those kind of things from happening. Why? Because I don't want to, you know, because of one fuse, I'm going to be, you know, holding the production from shooting for uh, half an hour, maybe, or 10 minutes. So I want to make sure that everything can run smoothly. I you know, take the initiative of getting spare equipment, spare battery plates. So I would just swap out the battery plates and then you know, I'll fix whatever the problem was later. You know? uh, because I, I can do my own electric works, I mean, electronic works, uh, soldering type things. Uh, so I'm not really worried about it because I, I would normally get extra stuff. So yeah, and I think uh, sometimes I would carry fuses. Not me, my second assistant would. So yeah, or I would get them from the rental house. Any more questions? No more questions. We're gonna go for a dinner break. I think I'm a bit late on that. I, I hope you guys are uh having dinner you know without me telling you um let's have that 30 minutes break and then uh we'll come back at uh 9 37 or yeah 9 37 and then i'll try and conclude today's session at 10 p.m because i think uh we've been uh, we've gone quite ahead yeah yeah and that's really not that much of uh, stuff to cover left. Oh, shit. I do have one more thing. Oh, I think if someone
someone would care to zoom in on this. This one, this paper says how to prep lenses. I haven't covered that yet. So sorry, kids, we're going to finish late tonight. It's going to be, we're going to finish about around about 1030. So let's have that break and we'll come back and we'll talk about how to prep lenses. Okay. Ah. Okay, uh simpan tepi dulu. Okay, it's on that one. Okay. So, uh, mungkin yang besar semua dah dinner. Eh? Semua. So, semua dah ready? Everybody in? Semua dah masuk balik. Okay, so <coughs> just a quick overview sebab uh, kita ada terlepas satu benda tadi, terlepas satu session where we should cover some item in the process. Okay, so basically as a camera assistant or focus puller, uh, one of the tools yang we most likely will need and will use is this. Kalau kita tengok dekat camera atas, this is called a laser measuring laser measuring so basically what it does is it measures distances by pointing a laser to something and then it will measure the distance like so like this here see there's a laser here uh, and we measure my cat's favorite toy <laughs> yeah mine as well okay so that's one of the tools another one of my favorite tools uh, that i like to keep around my kit when i go out on a shoot is this thing here my fat max this thing here is what I use when I want to measure really close distances, like say the camera from the cam, like say here, if I want to measure short distances like this, like, I, I mean, I would go on to a maximum of 10 feet. I wouldn't go that far. And this thing can, you know, stretch really far and it won't break. Imagine that. Yeah. 
So this is one of the tools that I would keep in my kit as a focus puller or camera assistant. And let me show you my floor bag. So if we can go to a top shot of this. So in here, I've got a multi-tool. This, it's, a, it's called a Leatherman sidekick. It's got uh, screwdrivers, flatheads, uh, and Phillips. I don't normally use them because if I wanna unscrew something, I would have a different screwdriver like this one. This one is a flathead or a, it's a sharp, it's called a sharp. So this is a screwdriver where, that I would use to unscrew plates or, you know, any given screw. And this I would use to, you know, tighten something like a, a bolt. I will just use this plier. Although it has a lot of things, it's got a knife. It's got a saw, a hand saw, which I don't normally use unless I am filming in the jungle. And this is a, these are quite neat. I just, uh, I bought these, I think last year for my own personal use when I wanna, when I'm filming in a dark place, in a less lit place, I would use these, these lights to, you know, light my mag liner so that, you know, see how bright those are. I mean, if it's in a dark place, it's gonna, you know, light the area. And the best part is the DP can use this as eye lights, you know, like this. If I go closer to the camera, uh, put this next to the camera. If I'm looking in the direction of the camera, offset, offset to the direction of the camera, I, it will become, it will turn into a, an eye light or an OB light. Which is a pretty neat thing to have. In here, there are several things that are uh, DIY, like this thing here. This thing here is actually for uh, for me to put my filters in. See, these are, if we go back to the top shot, these are actually ND3, 6, and 9. I mean, we don't really normally use all the filters that we have in our manifest. Like say, if we have a Blackmagic Pro Mist and uh, 85 or whatever filters we might, you know, uh, higher, we don't normally keep them around per se, but we do keep the very basics uh, with us whenever we want to travel. So it's easier like this. We could just put them in there. If you want one, like this is a clear glass. You will definitely need that all the time because just in case you're filming next to a big wave, you would want this in front of your lens, the clear glass. So there you go. And Here's another light, this one, I use to light my way when I'm moving around. I would have this, this is not a headlamp because I hate those things. I hate headlamps. I would use these things on my chest, see, like that. They would be on my chest and I could just, you know, switch it on, there you go. But you know, to each his own. Uh, you don't have to have a chest lamp. You could, you know, opt for a headlamp because some people like it. I I hate having stuff strapped to my forehead, so this is why I bought this. And this one here is a uh, it's a hex key, but. Uh, I don't know why I bought this. I rarely use them. But there are some, some uh, camera equipments that needs them. So like the red cameras and, you know, I don't know. It's been a while. The last time I opened this up was, uh, I think, the, when I bought it. That 
was the only time that I opened it. So here you go, if you can see that, it's a hex key. Okay, <clears throat> hex key. And I've got uh, a tube where I keep my laser pointer. I bet LV, your cat will love this if you have them. Yeah. There you go. See, it's not good to point lasers to the sensor, but I'm pointing to the, the just underneath the camera. laser pointer and I've got here a set of uh, Allen keys uh, normally if I want to normally I don't you I don't carry the whole thing I just leave them somewhere or you know because uh, I normally work with airy cameras I rarely work with the uh, um, red cameras so what I do is basically I would keep one of the keys that I would normally use, which is uh, surprisingly not here. I think it's probably on the table. Yeah, this one is a 3mm Allen key, which I would use on the camera. Like so. So if I want to uh, change configuration on the camera, I would just use this one Allen key. So 3mm, I would keep them. I would actually keep this in my pouch, which is this guy over here, my pouch. And in this pouch, if we go to the top shot, is my soft tape, my measuring tape. This is, well, I would use this when I wanna measure something further than 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, this is a tool that I would use. I would have, and I would also have Sharpies, oh, Sharpies for, you know, marking on the uh, marking rings for the WC. And uh, <clears throat> I don't normally keep so many stuff in here because I'm gonna have this strapped to my waist, which is gonna be constricting if I have really weighty bag on my person. So yeah. And uh, here's another DIY thing where I keep all the, uh, uh, these uh, clip-on mat boxes have uh, a mat mask in front of it, which uh, I would keep them in here for uh, easy transport. And I would also have these things, uh, air duster and baby powder. Or you could uh, find some chalk for um, like one of those surveyors would use to, you know, uh, mark the ground or whatever. Instead of using um, a tea mark or a sausage mark, you, you can just use uh, powder, baby powder, or um, chalk. You know. And this is a neat thing. Uh, one of my second AC made this. This is where we keep all the uh, filter tags. If you go to the top shot, uh, yeah, that's it. See, this is IR ND3. Normally, I would keep the most use whatever I use, whatever filters that I use most, uh, I'll keep the filter tags close or on the floor back itself. Like if you see here, there's three, six, nine, and then clear. And then there's one with the, word, the letters FPS for shots where we are changing frame rates and uh, we want to keep in mind that the frame rates are different from the shooting rates. And this one is uh, for shutter angle. If we were to, uh, to change from, uh, say, 172.8 to 90 degrees or something like that. And 
this one is rota polar. This is just a shorter version, rota pol. It's a polarizer. It's a rotating polarizer, and that's ah, uh, gloves. You never know when you need them, but when you really do need them, it's there. And this is a leveler, a spirit leveler, some would call it. Uh, I don't normally use this, but when I do, it's for because right now we we've got if we go back to the white shot. We can see you can I can show you that this one here. This is not a bowl head. This is a Mitchell base head. So it's a flat head. So whenever I want to uh, plant the tripod on a hill or on a steep slope or an, on any given slope, I would sometimes would use this. Or that, there is actually another thing that I would use to level the tripod, which is surprisingly not here. But it's basically a round uh, thing with a bubble in the middle where I could just put it on the uh, uh, the flat base where I could you know level the tripod. And in here I also have this. This is a plastic wrapper. So for when I want to wrap the monitor or you know whatever that is sensitive to water. I've got three different brushes and all three of them are for three different functions. This one is when I want to brush something like a mag liner, the top deck here. And then this one is something for more finer work. It's a, it's a very small brush and it's very soft. I don't normally bring this out, but when I do, it's for some really fine work. And then this one here is one of my favorite brushes because it's soft. And I would normally use this on the camera, but never on sensitive areas like the lens or whatever. And I've got bongo ties. If we go to the top shot, you can see that there's this bongo tie. It's a rubber um, loop with this uh, uh, drum stick. It's, well, basically it, what it does is that. So, yeah. And um got this thing this is a very cool thing where if say i wanted to cut the flare like if you can see on the top right of the frame here no uh, we're going back to the white shot top right of the frame there there's a bit of flare there let's see if i can cut the flare using this thing see no more flare flare no more flare. But imagine this uh, being next to the camera where I could just, you know, clamp this on here and just do that. Like that. That's how, uh, that's what I now normally keep on my uh, floor back so that I, I could, you know, carry around. And I've got this one, one of my favorite things actually. Mini slate. If we go to the top shot, you can see that uh, mini slate. Mini slate. Yep. And <clears throat> oh, here are a few of my filter tags where I keep most of my filter tags. Some of them are from. You know, I, I did all this from different jobs. And there's one thing that I don't normally see people use, but there's this one thing here. This is a silica gel, which, can, which you can reuse. 
you can actually take this outside and dry them. And then when it dries, you can use them again. It's a pretty neat thing. And then this plastic bag here, this, I dabble in 3D printing. I use this actually for my 3D printer filament. And what it does is actually, you take this pump here, you pump out the air. And well, essentially it's gonna suck out all the air. And well, you get the idea. It's gonna suck out all the air. What it does is basically it's just gonna you know, keep whatever that you want to be moist free, moist free. And uh, of course I would have uh, in here, I keep all my spare cables. But I don't normally carry them around with me. I just would keep them in a separate bag or a separate case, whatever the case may be. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, it's a, this is a general idea of what I would normally carry around with me. Well, what my second AC would carry around for me so that we could have quick access um, for uh, tools for cleaning, for uh, fixing, whatever, whatever the case may be. Okay, I think the more interesting thing to do now is a lens test. So how I, how I normally would do lens tests is uh, essentially I would begin by taking, picking a lens. Let's say currently we have a 50 mil ultra prime on the camera and <clears throat> Let's try to have a feed from this camera. Okay. We have the feed from the camera. I also need a change of battery. Okay. Okay, uh, do we have the feed from the camera? Okay, there you go. So what I would normally do uh, for camera tests, uh, especially for lens, is that I would stop it up to widest opening, which is currently the lens is at T19. And what I would do is basically trying to get the focus across the frame as sharp as I could possibly get it. Okay, now that's the sharpest. Notice that 
make sure you have to make sure that from here to here, from here to here is all sharp, including here, including the center here. If in in you know in in cases where you don't actually get them as sharp as you want them, uh, then you would definitely have to change the lens. Why? Because there's there's a light cleanness of the camera being, <clears throat> sorry, the lens being uh, either in terms of fo focal flange away too, too much away from the sensor or it's too close to the sensor. So you have to understand that focal flange is uh, uh, the distance between the front of the sensor mount, the lens mount, sorry, uh, the front of the um, lens mount to the focal plane, which is the sensor. So that amount of distance is the focal flange. So if in, in you know, cases where the focal flange is a bit shifted to outwards, then the focus is going to shift. Like say, this is currently at four feet and possibly 11 inches, right? Four feet and 11 inches. Let's measure that if it's accurate. And it is. But <clears throat> keep in mind, uh, the thing about lenses, and some, in some cases, they, they do tend to have uh, different characteristics. Um, some lenses, they are accurate at the close focus, but as you go further, it's not that accurate. Uh, this only happens due to, uh, due to the uh, uh, depth of, uh, I think, the focal flange, because, the, uh, because sometimes the uh, focal flange is uh, shifted a tiny bit, but you know, not as much. And because you have the widest opening, when you're going, uh, say, um, a closer distance, the, the, the depth of field is going to be very shallow. And because of that, you're going to get a more accurate distance, so to speak. It's quite a complicated uh, topic, actually. But yeah, so basically, uh, what you need to look out for is when you go um, with 50 mil, what I would normally do is that I would keep, uh, I would try my best to find a spot where it is not as sharp as I hope for it to be. I would find basically ada satu distance yang dia punya focus starts to shift. Like say, currently I have it at eight feet, more or less. So at eight feet, um, when you go, let's say the, 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 the starting point where the focus is uh, not accurate, like say 10 feet. Starting from 10 feet, it starts to um, get a bit off, right? From there, I will find the best, uh, you know, um, from there, if there's a shift in the focus, I would definitely remark the focus. So I would put a tape over the, over the lens, over the, the focus uh, uh, indicator on the lens, which is, uh, which is here. If you can see that. Let me just bring this closer. If you can see that. Yeah. There. Like say, starting from 10 feet, I need to shift the focus. I mean, I need to remark the focus from 10 feet onwards, right? So that's not much of a problem. But I don't normally do those markings on the lens because I try not to dirty up the lens. What I would do is if I'm using wireless follow focus, I would just 
we mark them here. So it's much simpler. It's uh, cleaner. It's not, you know, it's not messy. And uh, <clears throat> what I normally look out for when I'm doing lens tests is color shift, because uh, I think uh, if I think one of you were in, uh, some of you were in uh, uh, this morning's uh, DIT, no, sorry, VTR session, where I think they mentioned something about um, something about changing the lens would shift the colors. Okay, the only way you want to find out if the color is shifted is by turning on a vector scope on your monitor or I don't think the camera has any vector scope, but you could, you know, find it somewhere like in the monitor. And, you know, but yeah, normally if I were to look out for color shift, I would use a, a monitor. It doesn't have to be a calibrated monitor. It could be any kind of monitor um, that can show color as accurate as it could, you know? And from there, I would use the vector scope to judge the color shifts. If there is a color shift, then I would, you know, either advise the DP that if you're using this lens, you need to use a certain kind of filter, uh, a magenta filter or stuff like that, an 85, something like that, or change the lens. It's as simple as that. If you, if you look, uh, uh, there are some productions where you have to use two sets of different lenses. Like you can mix around um, an ultra prime lens, with master prime lens, you have to say you have to mix around with those two lenses because master prime has a neutral kind of tone. And then with the ultra prime, you have kind of warm kind of look. But say you want to go for the neutral kind of look, maybe a 32 mil has a more neutral look because you have to take into account the, if the lens, Let's say the lenses are, if you go up to 100 mil, 135 mil, those lenses are much longer than, like, say, this 50 mil. This 50 mil is this short. I mean, the amount, the distance from the light source to go through the lens, I mean, if you, if you I, I can't show you because it's quite dark in there, but the, the amount, the distance from this front area of the lens to the actual glass, element is about this far. It's about that far. And you can imagine that the light hits the sensor much, you know, quickly compared to like this lens is an 85 mil. It's about that much. So what I want to tell you is that these lenses have different ways of um, transmitting the colors which is uh, also another thing that I want to talk about uh, tomorrow, I think. Yes. I'm going to talk about uh, T-stops and F-stops, how, how T-stops are measured uh, by the transmission of the light, as opposed to um, F-stops. F-stops is basically a mathematical um, calculation of ratios between um, the widest opening of aperture to the front element to the, yeah, that's it. So that's how they calculate f-stops. It's a math mathematical uh, calculation between the front diameter to the actual aperture. As opposed to t-stops, which is what's on these cinema lenses. They've got, oh, they've got t-stops here. So these, T, the, the, the alphabet T means transmission. What it means is basically the transmission, the transmitted light from the front element to the back of the lens, uh, given the uh, absorption within the, the, the lens itself. Because in lens, there's uh, a couple of uh, elements, like there's the front element, there's the uh, uh, biconvex element, convex element, those kind of things. and then as it goes to the back, 
whatever goes through the back of the lens, that is what the measured amount of light. And that is actually what these number means. The amount of light that actually is coming from the back of the lens. So it's more accurate because, and it's the only thing that uh, cinematographers would like to use because it is more accurate compared to using f-stops. Because f-stops is uh, not really accurate. It's, uh, it's more like a, it's more like a, an estimation of uh, light coming through the lens. But with t-stops, it's more accurate. So um, I could go into detail with that. I'm going to send you uh, an article um, on T-stops and F-stops. Uh, I think it's more simpler in terms of explanation there. You can read through it and you can, you know, uh, if you have any questions about it, you can come to me. And then I'll, I'll explain it to you, what it's all about. But yeah, uh, what I do with lens tests is essentially trying to figure out if the lens is sharp all across the frame and finding if there are any color shifts because some lenses with the coating in front of the lens uh, could you know, decay. Because of that decay, uh, it might cause some color shifts. So to avoid that from happening during shooting, we have to test it before that. So, that's why we prep. We prep to find uh, the least amount of defects or you know, um, imperfections in lenses or camera, even the sensors. Sometimes you uh, have to test the sensors for accurate colors. Can you explain a little bit about back to school? Good job. Okay, uh, vector scope is, well, it's simple. There's a, if you look at the vector scope, because I don't have, because I didn't plan on explaining vector scopes, uh, but if you go over to the DIT class, which will be on the uh, eighth or ninth, uh, they will most definitely explain to you what vector scopes are. But, I can give you a brief uh, explanation what vector scopes, what vector scope is for, is basically uh, for you to find the color shifts, right? Okay, there is a circle, imagine a circle, and then there's just one line where it's, uh, I think it's uh, in between yellow and magenta or something. There's this line where it's, where it indicates the uh, skin tone. Ideally, you want that because you want the most neutral color possible where you will then bring it back to post-production where you will manipulate um, whatever you've shot. Uh, so vectorscope is essentially a tool for you to measure color. And it's quite a useful tool, actually. Uh, I've, uh, I've on multiple occasions where I've had to uh, use vector scopes to help the DP find the right balance of you know color. Because sometimes when you're, let's say this is the lighting setup, I've got a bunch of light in front of here. And then I have another shot, say shot from there. It's a different set of colors, right? If I, if I were to have a camera on the back, it's going to look a bit different from where I have now, right? Why? Because, uh, well, it's a different lighting setup and it's going to show a different color because right now it's all tungsten, it's all a bit warm, but from the back, it's going to look different because back there is uh, behind the camera is actually, you know, white walls and it's going to look pretty different because back there it's, the wall there is underlit, right? It's a different set of colors. It could be, I don't know, if, I, if it was on a vector scope, if we were to monitor that, that background on a vector scope, it could probably be magenta-ish or something, you know, cooler tone. Uh, 
as opposed to my skin now. My skin now, I can bet you it's probably on the warmer side where it's yellow or green. Oh yeah, it's between yellow and green. There's one line in the middle there. It's kind of like orange. So it's basically the skin color, essentially. If you go, you can actually um, experiment. If you've got a DaVinci Resolve, the free version or whatever, you can switch on the vector scope. You can, you know, play around with that, you know? Take a footage from a camera or something, put it on there. You can, you know, play around with the color wheels. You can see the color shifting around and, you know, we'll figure it out. Uh, do, did I explain that to you well enough about vector scope? Okay. Any other questions? I try to make this lens test as brief as possible because you know uh, I don't want to finish too late tonight. Uh, any other questions regarding lens test? What do you think uh, you want to look for for in a lens test? You want to look for flares, or you want to look for whatever you want color shifts, or some people like uh, shallow depth of field, but that's another thing for, you know, another time. Depth of field is, uh, it's not a mystery really. It's, a, it's, a, it's a quite an interesting topic to talk about, but, you know, it'll be a you know, talking heads kind of a video if I were to talk about depth of field. Focus breathing, okay. Ultra Primes, if you must know, has focus breathing. Let me show you a little bit of what I'm talking about. Ultra Primes are one of the uh, um, well, because they are quite old, these lenses. Um, this technology of lenses is uh, before, because now we have, we've got what, ultra primes with LDS, we've got master primes with less breathing. Now we've got the supreme primes, we've got the, um, what's that other thing? The uh, signature primes. Uh, those prime lenses are like the signature primes, they tend to have less breathing uh, as opposed to this lens. I'm going to show you uh, um, a feed from this camera. Yeah. Okay. So, so this camera, if you, this right now, I think it's, the feed from the Alexa camera. Let me just show you what I mean with focus breathing. Okay. So now I've proven that the Ultra Prime has focus breathe. Now, why is that? I mean, why is the focus, you know, breathing and it's shifting the, the camera size, oh, sorry, the frame size. It, this thing only happens uh, due to the lens mechanism inside the lens because, uh, well, I'm not really, uh, um, I'm not really well versed with optics, but I know a thing or two, but, you know, I don't want to pretend that I'm a pro explaining about uh, lenses, but yeah, uh, focus breathing happens because of uh, the, uh, the distance between the focus focus element and the uh, back element is, you know, a distance away. So it's, uh, it's uh, because if you go to a wider lenses, wider lenses tend to have, especially on the ultra primes, with ultra primes, they tend to have less focus breathing as opposed to longer lenses. Because uh, with wider lenses, the uh, lens element is, uh, is quite close to one another, actually. Let me show you what I mean in the moment. Uh, 
Hold on. Yeah. Oh. If you see here, see? If you see here, the lens element on the front of the lens is not that steep. See? And if you, there was a, there was a video uh, that talks about um, lens character. Like for this wide lens, the, uh, the lens element inside, the, the focus element inside of the lens is much closer to all the other elements, as opposed to the longer lenses. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Uh, the, the wider lenses, they have more distance apart and the movement for the focus is quite less. It's much less than the, uh, the longer lenses because, uh, sorry, it's not because, I mean, it's, it's further away from the back element, which makes the movement a bit less than the longer lenses. Because for longer lenses, it's, uh, if you can see, uh, the, because it's so close to the back element, any movement like, uh, have you ever been, have you ever experienced when you were, let's say there's a window, a window, right? A window, and then you're coming in to the window from a distance away. And as you're getting closer to the window, you start seeing the perspective widen up. So it's the same thing with long lenses. Long lenses is because of that distance away, as you go in, you tend to get that focus breathing the same way. It's, it's a complicated thing, but the same thing happens when you use longer lenses. So yeah, focus breathing tends to happen because of the lens element is too close. Do you have a method to test for that characteristic in the studio? Oh, well, well, that actually, if I'm not mistaken, those kind of things normally happens because of the, the surface that um, you're talking about, because that surface probably has some cracks or whatever. That also adds to the reason why there's a star flare, as, you're, as you've mentioned. But yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't know how to replicate that because, uh, you know, normally I would just look for, because it's pretty basic what I do with lens tests because I only test for the color shifts. And if there's a focus shift, if, uh, if it's off by three, four inches, that normally that's what I do. But if I were to test, uh, for flares, um, I would normally just add a filter on it, you know. Uh, I would find the filter that with least amount of color shift uh, that can add flares, like a star kind of flare, and uh, yeah. Isn't that a function of the iris plate and when the iris is pretty much open only very slightly? Yes, true, true. When you uh, <clears throat> close down the stop, like say a T8, T11, something like that. But you have to take into account the uh, shape of the iris because not all irises are made the same. If you look here, yeah. Like for this iris, it's, a, it's like an octagon the shape of an octagon. So it's almost pretty much a circle. If you're looking for uh, something that could cause flares like that, you will have to look for lenses with a hexagon, hexagonal shape. Or, uh, yeah, normally it's hexagon because I used to uh, take still photography uh, with lenses that has hexagonal shape irises. Those iris blades will uh, produce those kind of flats. Yeah. Yeah, true. Uh, I mean, yeah, the starburst shape. Yeah. Isn't that a, yeah, the starburst shape. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, true. Any other questions? I just want to, uh, I just hope that you understand that just hope that you understand what I'm trying to explain here is that I'm just testing for things that really matters in terms of color shift and uh, focus because uh, obviously I'm not the DP and uh, if you want to go further into that that requires the DP uh, to you know uh, instruct me because I can suggest um, things like uh, a different set of lenses. Yeah, because uh, I'm pretty sure that um, with, uh, because you have to take into account sometimes uh, different lenses, even though with, you know, the irises with the starburst shape or whatever, uh, when you kind of have to, uh, think about the colors as well, because that's my job. My job is basically to identify uh, the lenses that fits um, color-wise to uh, the project. I mean, basically, I'm just doing what you know what the DP is, is instructing me to do, and just making sure that the lens is uh, up to par with what the uh, DP wants. It's not. Uh, it's not necessarily trying to test, you know, certain kind of flare. But yeah, normally, if I were to test for flares, I would just, you know, wave around the light in front of the camera because you don't really need to, um, like David was just saying that, the light hitting a roof of a car or something like that. You don't really have to replicate that. You could just take a flashlight or something like that, just flash around in front of the lens, and then you could produce the same kind of light, the same kind of uh, effect. But yeah, iris blades are also, um, you know, uh, one of the key things that you have to take into account when you want to get those kinds of flare. Any other questions? Test the lens for focus. Do you test for only distance marking on the lens or also in between the marks? Okay. Um, lens cheat sheets that you put. Cheat sheets. Oh, okay. Let me. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I think there's a, another question there. Uh, when you test the focus, do you test for only the distance marking on the lens or also in between the marks? Okay, what I do normally is basically, um, because I, I tend to, with long lenses, I tend to measure really accurately from 20 feet and below, because those are the distances that uh, as it comes close, as a subject is coming closer to the lens or to the camera, it gets shallower and shallower and shallower. So I have to get accurate marks for 20 feet and below, 20 feet to you know minimum focus. So yeah, uh, in a sense, I do go in between the marks. And uh, what was? Yeah, exactly. It's creative aspects. I mean, I don't, um, I don't really have a, a kind of a, so in a way of saying that I don't really have that kind of a, um, call to you know uh, choose a certain kind of lens. I can advise for the DP to test as much lenses because you have to take into account that although 
uh, say that this kind of lens can you know produce those kind of flares, right? But it's just this one lens. Maybe with the wider lens, you can't get that. So you have to find a matching lens that can uh, produce that kind of flares with the same kind of look. Or the only way you can get the same flares is by sacrificing the overall look. Because what I do is basically making sure that the overall look is achieved uh, color-wise. And then uh, you were saying cheat sheets. Yeah, cheat sheets are basically, uh, well, they're not really for me, actually. They're actually uh, for, uh, if say the DP comes to me, they wanna know uh, how close <clears throat> can I go before I start uh, losing the background? Like say you're using a wide lens and you wanna do a close up of someone with say a 24 mil or 32 mil or 28 mil. Uh, and you wanna, you wanna figure, you wanna find out if, uh, if I go closer, how much closer I can go before I start losing the background. Because there is a point when you don't really see the background. It's just a blur mess, blurry mess with you know, no details, no nothing. So uh, those are essentially for me, because I already more or less memorized the kind of depth of field that I'm working with. If those cheat sheets have a minimum focus, I would just, you know, okay, if you go, say five feet closer, you definitely gonna lose all the background and stuff like that. You know, it's not really um, uh, a thing that I normally would have a conversation with the DP because the DP that I mostly work with, they just do whatever they want. I'll just, you know, uh, try and, you know, cater to whatever the DP wants. Non-parfocal lens. Okay, uh, well, how do I test it? Well, there isn't really much that I can do about non-parfocal lens because uh, as it stands, unless that lens has a back focus adjustment, I can do it. But if it doesn't, if it's like say, one of those uh, EF lenses, the, the, the Canon 70 to 200, I, I did a shoot once with that lens, uh, of a car coming, a sports car actually. It's a, it's a I think a, a, it's not a rally, but it's a, it's an endurance race car coming straight for my camera car. Uh, we started we started out with a really long uh, zoom. I mean, we zoomed in uh, at the end of the barrel. Uh, I think it was two hundred because we had a doubler, I think. So it was 400. And then as the car is coming closer, we, the, the DP would zoom out. So what I do if, if I'm dealing with a non-power non focal lens is that I try <laughs> my best to get that focus, really. But normally you kind of have to you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very tricky kind of a situation where you, you know, you have to do it anyways, because uh, you'd be surprised that there are much ex expensive lenses that are not power focal at all. Like uh, I've experienced ones with a, an Allura 45 to 50, we were doing a, like a vertigo shot. There was this moment when the, uh, as the camera is zoomed out, the focus went with it, but it went further. Uh, I think, no, sorry, it went, it came closer. When we were supposed to, um, when the focus is supposed to stay put, but it's not. So it's probably because of the mechanism. It's not something that I could fix, but I could try to, uh, you know, uh, compensate for that if I see a shift in the focus, this is when your communication with the DP is at its most crucial because you have to talk to the DP. Can you, let's say uh, the shot is very slow, 
So you kind of have to ask the DP to whether, you know, slow it down or, you know, you know, pace it up or something like that. Or when in, in the case of when we were shooting that sports car, uh, I had to ask the DP to, you know, uh, slow down on the zoom out, you know, because obviously I want to get the camera, the, the shot as sharp as possible, right? So this is one of the things that uh, as a focus puller, you kind of have to uh, have a confidence to ask for because some focus pullers, they either, you know, shy away from it, from asking for help because you can't have an ego when you're pulling focus because, you know, eventually if you can't pull focus, then, you know, you're going to screw up the shot. The DP is going to, you know, get pissed off or whatever. But yeah, uh, if you know that that shot is difficult, it's not powerful focal kind of lens, uh, then you have to communicate with the DP. That's the best way, that's the best solution that I could give you because the only, the better solution is get a lens fixed or get a better lens. That's it. I mean, non-power focal lenses uh, normally, um, they are normally um, still lenses. There are like the Ingenue 25-250 HR zoom. Uh, those lenses, uh, because they are old, uh, I don't think they send them for regular services, but they are old. Uh, those lenses are not power focal as well. I, I've had a few experiences with those lenses, but yeah. Yeah. Which one in AFE is power focal? Uh, there are quite a few actually. Uh, most of them, but there are, there's this one particular 45 to 50, but I think it's not because of the lens. It's because of the mechanism inside the lens. It's probably faulty or something like that. Any other question? We're, we're, we're actually at 1041. Uh, I'm taking last questions. Uh, any last questions before we go? Any cool hand signs? Your silent, silent telepathy vibe. Okay. Well, don't really have any, you know, cool hand signs, but, um, but I do have, you know, hand signs like numbers to tell them uh, numbers most of the time. I mean, maybe this. Or uh, stuff like that. I mean, it's, you guys do it all the time, I think. Anything else? Final, final question. Just one more question and then that's it. No more and then we'll... Uh, conclude today's session and then uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Counterbalance? Yeah. Did you cover that? No, I don't. You want me to talk about the counterbalance on, on an O'Connor head. Well, basically counterbalance is, uh, as it says, it's a counterbalance. Say um, it's uh, when you find the center point of the camera that is balanced, sometimes it's so narrow because you have to imagine this. Uh, if the camera, you have to take it like a, like a triangle kind of shape, say, the camera is balanced. So the balance of the camera is so narrow, you will have to have the counterbalance as um, high as possible, as uh, frictioned, so to speak. 
or if the counterbalance is wider than you know usual then you won't have that much problem but counterbalance is for uh, is for to you know in a way to get the springs uh, tighten up the springs inside so that you know when you want to tilt down like say like so it's not gonna go on its own as opposed to if i were to make the counterbalance lighter like right now it was from 36 to 31 see the camera just drops like that see so counterbalance what it does is basically uh imagine your uh suspension right suspension is basically trying to compensate the the weight of in the front and the back. So, you know, basically it does that. Yeah, exactly. Too much, then it's too hard to tilt. Yeah. Or, yeah, tilt. Okay. Uh, so, if there's no more questions, uh, I'll, I just want to say thank you for. Uh, joining me today talk, to talk about uh, camera assistance and focus pullers and what they do, uh, how to prep, essentially. It's not a, a thorough how to prep, but it's a, you know, a brief one. It's just to get you to understand how much work that goes into prep. You have to understand uh, that prep is for you to get prepared when you go on to set. You have to read the script. You have to find out what you need. But I'm telling you now, if one day you want to prep or something, you can email me. I can come. And I can help you. Or if you have a problem, uh, go to my website or email me personally or call me, text me, whatever. I'm happy to entertain. I mean, I've already entertained quite a number of people before uh, for prep. So I have no problem entertaining anyone for prep. And, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, let's finish off today and I'll see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. hopefully uh, on time. And uh, just a heads up tomorrow, we will be talking about how to slate, which we were supposed to be talking about that today, but yeah, I'll talk about that tomorrow. And how do I, how I prep for gimbal and handhelds. I already talked about those today. So maybe I'll just go much deeper into that. And then setting up the camera, stuff like that. So I guess uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. If you guys have any questions, save them for tomorrow, pose them to me tomorrow. And I'll try and answer those questions. And till then, I'll see you guys again. Goodbye.